personal computers proliferating on company desktops, it was a logical next step to connect them all into a network. Logical, maybe, but first someone had to figure out how to do it. And the guy who did was Bob Metcalf. <coughs> Apparently their sleep is deep. <coughs> Not working today. They're old and rare, and they're um, Gloucestershire old spot pigs. They're the sort of pig's pig, the classic pig. Uh, they're not commercially viable. So, Bob, fortunately, I'm not at all pig averse. But reassure. Yeah, you're very sweet. Bob Metcalf owns a farm in Maine, but we wouldn't call him a farmer. This farm exists to preserve genetic diversity, not to make a living. Bob doesn't need to work. His claim to fame is to be the first computer networking millionaire. How did he do it? It helps to have uh, good parents, and then it helps to uh, work really hard for a long period of time and go to school forever, and then it works to drop quite by accident into the middle of Silicon Valley where you're swept up into a inexorable process of entrepreneurship and wealth generation and you pop out the other side with a farm in Maine. I, I hate to oversimplify. Bob Metcalf started his computer science career as a summer alternative to working at the beach club. I took computer programming courses because my fraternity brothers told me that if I took 6251, which was systems programming, that I could get a job in the summer for appreciably more than I would uh, was then getting during the summers as a cabana boy. They have a waiting list because these are really scrumptious, scrumptious lamb chops. He helped build the original ARPA network as a graduate student. And I was at Harvard, miserable and unhappy, looking for research, and I ran across ARPA opportunities to work on the ARPANET. He landed a research job in Silicon Valley, but Bob went from Boston to California via Hawaii. Bob had just finished his PhD. He had uh, taken a job at Xerox Park, and Bob is a consummate salesman. Uh, imagine this, if you had just gone into a new job, before you showed up for work, you'd get your boss to send you to Hawaii for three months. Uh, Bob did that. <laughs> Bob's career in networking really took off when he got hired here. In the history of PCs, this is the place, the whole enchilada. It's Jerusalem, Rome, and Mecca all rolled into one. Think of anything about PCs. One processor per user, graphical user interfaces, laser printers. It was invented right here at Xerox Park. And that includes a method of linking desktop computers together so that nerds could share work, software, spreadsheets, printers, and my sister's phone number. Push another button, and the information is sent electronically. The folks at Xerox Park in the mid-1970s were living in the future. Long before the IBM PC or the Macintosh, at Xerox they invented a personal computer called the Alto, and there was one on every researcher's desk. We knew, we knew as a fact what the world was going to look like ten years, because we had already built it and we saw that it worked. So we knew what to do. Uh, first you do this, then you do this, because we did it already. Using technical ideas from both ARPANET and ALOHANET, Bob Metcalf invented a way of linking Park's Altos together. People don't get how revolutionary that was, but it was our research goal to put a computer on every desk, not to, let alone every building. So we needed a network that would connect um, hundreds of computers at hundreds of kilobits per second at hundreds of meters of separation. That was our spec. And out popped a network for doing that at 3 megabits per second uh, among up to 256 computers separated by up to a mile along one big piece of coaxial cable which we called the ether. Larry Tesler remembers Bob's breakthrough, a technical triumph of bigger bits and smarter packets. It came up a little bit at a time. First they were able to just send uh, a few signals back and forth and then a few bytes back and forth and entire packets and then they were able to do entire streams of packets and after a while it really worked and they created a lot of Ethernet boards and everybody in Park who had an Alto got a board and we could start using the Ethernet. It was a pretty exciting time. We built computers to sit on everyone's desk and then watched what happened. And so we worked in an economics-free zone, which is a way that 
research is often conducted, and uh, produce this network of PCs, an internet of PCs. We built our own internet. Call it a paper explosion, or data overload, or asset mismanagement. What's needed is not a new system, but a new concept. This is the Ethernet cable, a passive carrier capable of accepting transmissions from various kinds of office machines and terminals. And With the invention of Ethernet, PC networking became a practical possibility. For the PC pioneers, this was the realization of a dream. Well, the whole vision of why personal computers would be a great thing on every desktop in every home had to do with using them as a communications tool, had, to, had them connected together. People thought, gee, wouldn't it wouldn't be great if we could get these devices to work as a community. And so you suddenly had a device that you really wanted to plug into a network. So they would all work in concert, or at least could exchange messages and share files and that kind of thing. Uh, so the PC really wa gave birth to the networking age. We suddenly had something that we wanted to network. It's right here. See it? Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Bob Metcalf isn't just a clever technologist. He's also an Stop. entrepreneur. <laughs> when Xerox didn't exploit Ethernet widely, Bob thought hey, he could. So fence? he opened up the directory of fence? Western fence Venture Capitalists. Slow him down in any Starting in November 78, I started going through that directory, having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with everybody I could find on that, in that directory, not to raise money, I just asked them how to start a company. In June of 79, I sat down to name my company and ended up calling it Computer Communication Compatibility 3Com. With a cute corporate name and a check from his backers, Bob's new company set about building Ethernet cards, just as the PC boom began. Great timing and very profitable. Yeah. Amazing. Congratulations, you're now a member of the Maze Club. Thank you one card for a thousand dollars they now go in quantity for nineteen dollars each but a thousand dollars could put your PC on the Ethernet of course we had to build a network operating system to make it useful which we did and we shipped all that in September of 82 and uh, people started buying it and by 1983 we were growing fifty to eighty percent per quarter sequentially and by March of 84, we were public with about 12 million in revenue. And by the time I left in 1990, we were 400 million people, 400 million dollars a year with 2,000 people. And now, in 1997, the three com is a five billion dollar company with 12,000 people. Incredible. This Xerox sales pitch exaggerated Ethernet's range. It was a thousand feet, but Ethernet still vastly transformed the usefulness of PCs. The challenge now was to design a commercial computer specifically to exploit the advantages of a network. It wasn't long in coming. Is it a PC? Is it a mini computer? No, it's a workstation. What's the difference? Well, unlike those first two, this machine can't do any work by itself. It has to be part of a network. This is the original Sun workstation from 1982, quite a landmark in the history of the Internet. The young people who designed it coined the term, the network is the computer. So with this workstation, I can access information on other computers on the network. I can store my information on other computers on the network, and I can harness the power of every computer on the network. Those folks at Sun, they're very bright. The Sun workstation has become an eight billion dollar business. When the PC was little more than a high powered typewriter, workstations had the processing power to meet the needs of Wall Street, NASA, and even Hollywood. Guess where it started? This is Margaret Jacks Hall at Stanford University, one of the most historic buildings of the digital age. Three companies got their start here. Cisco Systems in the basement, Silicon Graphics on the second floor, and Sun Microsystems on the fourth. Collectively, they must have a market value of over hundred billion dollars. And Stanford University never made a penny from any of them. What are they doing to this place? Uh, the first Sun workstation was built in an office on this floor by a young German graduate student named Andy Bechtelsheim, who just couldn't wait to get out of the fatherland. 
I was actually quite frustrated with the, the German university program at the time because I, I, I truly felt I was wasting my time. You know? So the, the first thing I went when I went to a German university in, in the middle, middle 70s was I applied to come here. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it was very boring. <laughs> and it, it was simple things like, you know, we, we had to sign up for terminals to use a computer and you can only get one hour of terminal time per week. You know, I mean, how, how can you even learn programming in this way? A clever geek like Andy is essential to any digital startup, but in order to succeed, you also need someone with a driving ambition to get things done. For some, that spark came from a Stanford graduate from India, Vinod Koshla. Ever since I was 16, going to high school in India, I dreamed of coming to Silicon Valley to start a company. I was a technology geek. Uh, and it was a very much a dream of mine to start a company. In fact, in 76, when I graduated from engineering school in India, I tried to start a technology company in India, which was a hopeless ta task. Andy had designed an engineer's workstation. Short of funds, he used standard parts like the Motorola processor and Ethernet and licensed his design to anyone who'd pay. We had this crazy idea that if we build a a 30 bit a microcomputer with a, a big screen display and an Ethernet connection running the, the Unix operating system, we would have the perfect product for the, you know, the researchers and the scientists and the students at Stanford. Andy was developing the Sun technology at Stanford. He had complete rights to it. He was in the middle of finishing his PhD. When I first approached him, he said he didn't want to start a company, but he would license all of the Sun technology to me for $10,000. And I said, I don't want to do that. He said he didn't want to quit his PhD. And he said he had already licensed it to about five other players. And I said, I want the goose that lays the golden egg. I don't want the golden egg. Vinod made Andy an offer he couldn't refuse, half his share in the embryonic company. Vinod got his goose. And with an Indian and a German on board, how about an American? Scott McNeely, Vinod's best friend. Now it was time to divvy up the jobs. There were two MBAs, Vinod Kosla and myself. He had done a startup before, so when he, we sat around and he said, what job do you want? And I go, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything about this stuff. And he goes, well, why don't you be CEO? And I said, no, no, I don't know anything about it. You be it. So we had an argument, and he finally agreed to be CEO. To complete their startup, they needed a software specialist, so they went for the best, a legendary programmer at Berkeley named Bill Joy, who had already delighted his university by creating for them their very own version of the Unix computer operating system. Um, they, they showed up at my office at Berkeley, and I thought these were like the engineers, and not the, I didn't realize these were the principals. You know, they looked so young and so innocent that I just I, I sat them in my corner of my office and made them wait till the rest of the people showed up. And then we had uh, uh, Bill Joy and Andy. The first time they met, they did a Vulcan mind meld, and you were just kind of like holding each other's forehead. <laughs> you couldn't get too near them because the sparks and the smoke and the flame. And at Berkeley, Bill would simply take the system, the Unix system, and rewrite it over the weekend. No, no human on the planet could do this except for Bill. And you'd come in in the following week and say, what has Bill changed now? And every once in a while, he'd decide to do a new release. And he'd do a release every three months. And he would personally read and write, or rewrite, all of the code in the system, including all of the applications. Inconceivable today and amazing at the time. So far, this was a startup from a textbook. But for this quartet from America's melting pot, there was still one final hurdle to be crossed, getting funding for their idea. Often, this is a nightmare. But for these sun seekers, this American dream was, well, a no-brainer. We wrote a five-page business plan. Uh, a week or two later, we showed it to some venture people. They said, oh, this is great. You know, here's a check for you. Basically, we shot them the, the plan on Thursday, Friday. On Tuesday, we had a check in the hand, and we started the company. It was four of us sitting in a little basic, uh, basically rent-by-the-hour office space in Santa Clara. I had three years of business experience, which was more than the other three founders combined. We were all 27, and we got our first load of furniture and got asset tag numbers and tagged one of the chairs asset number one and had employee number one with all the intellectual property in, with the cardboard box sit in asset number one and took a picture. The Sun workstation was designed from the start to be part of a network. The whole concept of the network is the computer. We started uh, the Sun 15 years ago based on the fact that every computer should be hooked to every other computing device. 
uh, on the planet, and uh, that's been our strategy and our goal from uh, day one. Computers become much more useful once they're connected because it's the, the sum of the computers on the network that allow you to, to do more than you could do on any individual computer. Because Andy had used off-the-shelf software and hardware for his workstation, Sun made a virtue of necessity and based all their products on these open standards. It made them different from companies like Microsoft and Apple, and they've been the champions of open standards ever since. We added openness. In other words, nobody should own the written and spoken language of computing in the same way that nobody owns English, French, or German. Now, Microsoft might disagree and think that maybe they ought to own the written and spoken language of computing and charge us all a $250 right to use license to speak English or Windows or whatever they happen to own. <laughs> On the Stanford campus, computer scientists are known to be nimble both at juggling and business opportunities. Most networking advances come from graduates in university labs, yet it's the geeks smart enough to exploit their work who have reaped the financial rewards. Sun may stand for Stanford University Network, but Stanford didn't cash in. Stanford never want, owned a piece of Sun. They did not want any piece of it. Um, I bet they, they lived to regret that. They lived to regret that. In fact, the funny story goes, uh, Prime and DEC both looked at the technology, evaluated it, and said they didn't want it. On that basis, I think Stanford decided it wasn't of much value and they let Andy own it. Stanford actually had a very, in fact Berkeley had very enlightened and still do very enlightened uh, technology perspectives and that is the student developed that they could take the intellectual property and, and go out. So Andy, when he created the Stanford University Network, under government grants, as well as help from Stanford, he was allowed to walk out with the intellectual property or the IP and uh, start a company with that. Sun's timing was perfect. They caught the wave of networked computers and offered a low-cost solution for another need. This was the 80s, and Wall Street was crunching numbers faster than ever for junk bond issues, arbitrage deals, and other kinds of financial smoke and mirrors. Sun workstations filled the trading rooms of banks, brokerages, and minimum security prisons. The thing about Wall Street is it's extremely competitive. In other words, if somebody can, can compute something or figure something out faster than the guy next door, it doesn't matter what the equipment costs, that's what they want. So each trader wanted to have the, the fastest, highest-powered workstation right on the table so to do better trading. And uh, Sun eventually became you know, the dominant standard on Wall Street for trading workstations, uh, not just on Wall Street, actually worldwide. It wouldn't be the last time that Stanford would watch a hugely profitable company ride off the campus. Utah, journeys end for the early Mormon wagon trains and home to their church, an unlikely place on the face of it for the next development in network. Perhaps not when you consider the virtues of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Hard work, commitment, the will to overcome great odds to reach the promised land, and of course, great singing voices. The networking breakthrough occurred at a most unlikely place, a computer systems company in deep financial trouble. Here's just the faintest reminder that this was the first home of Novell Data Systems, now Novell. It was a startup that failed. Lots of startups fail. Some fail and die. Others fail and are refocused and reborn. That's what happened with Novell. The company was really in trouble. They were shopping around for new venture capitalists. They'd run out of money. and. Actually, at the eleventh hour, uh, the week before Ray Norda came on, they were at, we actually had a little uh, auction at the company, and we were selling desks and chairs and equipment so we could make the payroll the next week. And uh, Ray Norda literally came at the eleventh hour and uh, uh, rescued us. It wasn't the U.S. cavalry, but the next best thing. 
Ray Norda was a veteran turnaround wizard, venture capitalist, and Mormon. Some say he was sorry for the people at Novell. He was called in to save the company. The treasure Ray Norda found in the ruins of Novell was a software project called Netware started only a month before. Netware allowed users to store their data files on big PCs called servers, to share their data with other users, and to use any printer on the network. PCs just couldn't do this stuff before. And the guy who thought it all up, Drew Major, wasn't even a Novell employee. But that Ray, he knew a winner when he saw one. Mountain biking in the Wasatch Range. I quickly discovered that my brain functions better at sea level. But despite the thin air, Novell prospered. Ray came in, investors brought him in and said, can you fix this? Can you, can you turn some money? And he said, you know, the future is software. It's software that connects these computers together and got us out of hardware. And later got us completely out of hardware, which was, at one time, hardware was 60% of Nobel's business. So to, to get out of that was a big move, but it paid off in spades. We caught this vision. We knew that the industry was going to need file servers, and they're going to need to share data. And though the company was falling apart, we, we just kept cranking on it, because we knew that, for example, if the company would have went bankrupt, we were contractors. They didn't even have us under a contract. We would have had uh, at least some some rights to what we had developed, and so so that kept us going. And of course, the vision, even though the company itself, business-wise, was in real trouble. And, and Ray saw that enthusiasm. I think he got a glimpse of how big it was. I think in the high-tech area, you, you know, you could you could say it was technology. We we're fast. You could say it was people. Drew is really smart. Uh, he was a brilliant man. Uh, Ray was strategic in what he did. But it has a lot to do with timing. The, the advent of the PC, the market need, Novell filled it. In December, we went and saw an IBM PC, the first one in Utah. IBM did a lot of stuff right, so we thought, well, hey, we could network, network that. And so uh, we bought the first IBM PC in Utah. We were the first guys to network the IBM PC. We've got three calls holding in network client utilities, 22 minutes being the longest wait time. This is Novell's very own customer radio station. It's here to keep NetWare users amused while they're on hold. When you have millions of customers, this is the price of success. Here we go into the next set. Norda's business savvy and major software skills created a global market and turned Novell around. Quite frankly, the thing that's amazed me the most is other people for, for a number of years didn't get it. They were focusing on other things, the sexy things. This was kind of plumbing, you know, who wants to write a file server, file systems, you know, that's, that's old stuff. That's not, but it was very strategic and very fundamentally valuable for us. They had figured out the most cost-effective way to link a bunch of personal computers together. They had taken a, a very small part of the problem. They decided we're going to let you, you know, share files off disks, uh, we'll let you attach all these computers together in the network and we'll let you share files and we'll let you share printers and maybe send email back and forth and that's pretty much it and uh, virtually everyone wanted to do that with their PC network and they came to utterly dominate the, P you know, the PC network world and that red box at their height was as common as any logo I can think of. It was the equal, certainly the equal of Microsoft uh, in those days. If you needed a PC network, if you, you know, and the IBM PC and the Intel-based PCs were just growing by leaps and bounds, and we connected them together better than anybody. So ours was the LAN operating system of choice. So everyone here has a chart stream in their backyard? Not everybody. But the rewards for success in Utah are not so different from Silicon Valley. Well, maybe you wouldn't have a trout stream at the bottom of your Palo Alto garden. Certainly, the guys at Novell have done nicely. David Bradford is their general counsel. He catches the fish here so often, he knows them by name. There's a little beaver maybe coming up the other side. Oh, yeah. Well, so I'm going to time you. How long will it take to catch a fish? Uh, it could be two casts, but I would guarantee a fish within 50 casts. Well, that's a good cast. There, oh, boy, look at that. Okay. We got okay. Oh, oh, Did you see that? We lost him, but he was a nice one. In the 80s, no one could catch Novell. I know what you're wondering. Here we are, halfway through the story. We've had everything from prize pigs to Mormons, and still no sign of Microsoft. How can that be? 
What's Bill Gates doing? Well, time for a flashback. Cue dissolve and archive footage. The 80s were good to Microsoft. Thanks to their partnership with IBM, the money rolled in and the company got bigger and bigger. But it was a love-hate relationship. They loved the royalties from selling all that software for IBM PCs and clones. But Bill Gates hated having to fit Microsoft's plans into IBM's business strategy. One thing that's hard to remember now is that all of us uh, were in fear of IBM because IBM wasn't just thought of as a hardware company. They were thought of as the everything company. Supplying most of the operating systems in the world's personal computers might be enough for some people, but Bill's always hungry for the next opportunity. In the computer market, when the first person comes along and does something very well, if they get over a certain threshold, then uh, it really develops momentum because the distribution channel doesn't want to learn a lot of products. They don't want to trust a lot of products. And once you get a customer base, they start talking to you about, why don't you fix this? Why don't you improve that? And we've seen many, many products like that in the history of personal computing. Some Microsoft products, some non-Microsoft products. Network is a great example of that. Whenever someone builds a big business, uh, you know, some people say that this is a bad thing, some people say it's a good thing, but it's clearly a thing. Uh, Bill looks at how does that business relate to the businesses we're in, and if that's a good business on a standalone basis, let's get into it, and certainly if it's a good business that's adjacent to related to our businesses, we better get into it. In the 80s, there was a very good adjacent business that Microsoft didn't dominate, networking. Novell. It was stomping all over the competition. Novell grew up with a gun to its head. Remember when, when, when Novell started, there was two companies. I'll remind you, they were Microsoft and IBM. Novell was an accident in their minds, as should not have been. And, you know, I, I guess we challenged that. And we're an underdog. We, we had nothing to lose and everything to gain. One thing about Microsoft is, you know, we're very competitive, and and if we don't start seeing results, I mean, you know, it, you know, Bill makes life tough on everyone, and um, I mean, I kind of felt bad for the networking guys because, you know, we continued to struggle. And around 83 and 84, and certainly by 85, network was reaching critical mass, uh, and uh, so Microsoft felt really. Uh, like there was a huge missed opportunity. In fact, I remember some memos Bill wrote in circa 85, 86, where he said, you know, one of the biggest disasters for the company uh, is that uh, uh, is that we have no assets in networking or very weak assets in networking. Live from Salt Lake City, it's Brain Share Tuesday morning with Bob and Tina. And now here's Bob, and here's Tina. Novell had great assets in networking. They even had network conventions and zany network infomercials. While IBM wasn't interested in networking PCs, Microsoft was. So Bill cast his eyes to Utah. Well, Gates was very focused on Novell, and in fact, in 1989 um, was the first time he contacted us, late 1989, to see if he wanted, uh, see if Novell was interested in being bought. Really? So that started two episodes of Microsoft trying to buy Novell. We all thought, hey, maybe if we band together, uh, we'll be able to compete and get you know, some portion of the market in a world that, that IBM dominates. And, and so that was a motivating factor, both of the times that we uh, sat down and talked. The thing that makes it tough, though, is you get two different development sites, and if you have this vision of an operating system, a single operating system that's going to do everything, having those multiple sites and those different visions is tough. But I have to say it's, it's surprising that we never got together. There's a traditional Microsoft tactic. If you can't join them, beat them. Microsoft looked for a partner to line up against Novell. At the time, I mean, we thought that, well, you know, wouldn't it be great to align ourselves with someone else? And, and we thought that the, that the best partner to compete against uh, Novell, um, you know, would have been 3Com. And so we actually entered into a kind of a strategic uh, relationship with 3Com that ultimately, uh, you know, didn't turn out very well. But, uh, but nevertheless, it, it actually got us bootstrapped um, and into the networking business. In the late 80s, in our frustration with Novell, we threw in, we 3Com threw in with Microsoft 
to unseat Novell in the networking software business. Yeah, you know, we both went into it with a, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy. I think we wound up having a business relationship that was cumbersome at best, a technical relationship that was a little bit difficult, and that enterprise met a horrible end uh, in the late 80s. A horrible end. A horrible end, ultimately leading to my departure from 3Com. The cause of Bob's horrible end is still a matter of dispute, but everyone now agrees that Microsoft and IBM had a falling out, and then so did Microsoft and 3Com. What Microsoft failed to tell us was that their relationship with IBM was falling apart at that moment. Uh, which came as a big surprise about three days after we signed the deal. We eventually separated. I think there was good intent on both companies' part. I frankly, to this day, think we managed the thing very professionally. I know Metcalf has, has you know, some bitterness about it, but we were both properly looking after our business interests and properly both companies trying to be good partners. And then in 1989, uh, Microsoft announced OS2 Land Manager. And I can remember reading the headlines, OS2 Land Manager going to put the network operating system out of business. And they predicted by 1991, Microsoft would have 60% share of the network operating system market with OS2 Land Manager. And said that Novell's share of the same market would drop to 25% by 1991. Well, by 1991, our share of 50% that we had in 1989 had grown to 75%. And they still hadn't made a dent. So, when that product failed to take off to Microsoft's satisfaction, the middle-level managers at the company there had to blame someone. They blamed us, and so Microsoft double-crossed 3Com and went around us to our own customers with our own product, and uh, so 3Com went into a loss situation just long enough for the board of directors of 3Com to decide they needed a new change, a new management. I don't think he has a reason to be as bitter as, as, as he is. No, I mean, we were two companies, two growing companies, with grown people are operating the companies, and we attempted to do a business deal together. We attempted to make land manager and sell and attempt to make their products sell, and they committed to selling a certain amount of it uh, with their products, and uh, um, they weren't able to do that, and I think that he felt that we sort of unfairly got them into the contractual situa situation. Um, but, you know, it takes two people to sign a contract. When I complained to Microsoft about this, I said, why is it doing this? And the guy involved, who I will not name, but the guy involved looked me straight in the eye and said, you made a mistake. You trusted us. <laughs> <laughs> Far from the high-stakes rivalries of networking market share, the grassroots of the Internet were steadily growing and in unconventional directions. More users were tuning in and turning on, attracted by the chance to connect with like-minded people, even dead people. No one should underestimate the influence on the development of the Internet of the Grateful Dead. So I've got my t-shirt, my VW microbus, and I'm headed out now to see a guy who knows exactly what a long, strange trip it's been to the wired world. You are listening to Dead to the World on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley or KFCF in Fresno. My name is David Gans. There are a million ways to appreciate the Grateful Dead, and we found a lot of ways to talk about them. One place they talked was in cyberspace. Deadheads could now meet in an online virtual community called the Well, or Whole Earth Electronic Link. Even a virtual community needs a real computer. The Well's server was based in Sausalito, California, home of Stuart Brand. You began to get some entities like the Deadheads, the people that were basically following the Grateful Dead, who were not a regional phenomenon at all. And wh where they became regional was on the well. That was their neighborhood. On March 1st, 1986, the Grateful Dead Conference opened its doors, and various people from the net came over and got accounts. And even more interestingly, various people went out and bought computers so they could get online and start talking with us. We're credited with 
generating sufficient cash flow to keep the well going through its early startup days. It was it was great to see it. It was really really fun because we were people who had a lot to talk about. Well, I know what its impact was on the on the well, which was it probably saved our butt. Oh, oh it just gave us a commercial scale of absolutely dedicated customers all in uh, you know, a couple of months. One fell swoop, suddenly here's a bunch of people who want to talk to each other all the time. Then tape trading. I would imagine that tape trading is responsible for, oh, 18% of the entire packet traffic on the Internet right now. I made that up, Bob. <laughs> but it's huge. There's a book called The Great Good Place that came along about halfway along in the starting of the well, which is about great pubs and barber shops and beauty shops and coffee shops where people go and they just hang out and it's not work and it's not their house, it's this other third place that they go to just hang. The well became a great good place. Brinsley's fourth law of commerce states, new media create new opportunities. But what kind of profit could anyone turn on the strictly non-commercial internet? John McAfee was the first person to answer that question. He gave away his antivirus software and made a fortune. Nice life. The unique thing about software, which I had, I had thought about you know, ever since the, uh, the mid-70s, is that Software production is unlike any other production that preceded it. Again, no raw materials are required. No time is required and no effort is required. You can make a million copies of a piece of software instantaneously for free. And there's something unique about that. And I, I've, I, I kept you know, running it around in my mind thinking, oh, what can you do with this? What? It's, it's so unique. It's so unusual. Nothing like it has ever appeared in the world before. And finally it came to me, aha! a new business paradigm. You just give it away because it doesn't cost anything. You simply charge for the update process. You get the copy free, you can use it as long as you want. If you want the updates, we'd be happy to give them to you for a nominal fee. And after we had five or ten million copies out there, it was a very simple process to turn the switch and begin charging for updates. It's time to explain another key figure in our story, the venture capitalist. Without the VC, few new technologies would be built. Fewer geeks would attain fabulous wealth. Perhaps even the information revolution itself would never have happened. This is a VC watering hole near Palo Alto. In the 1980s, networking companies became a third industry segment alongside PCs and software. More companies meant more venture capitalists and more power breakfasts. This is Buck's Restaurant in Woodside, where the VCs meet to figure out how many millions they'll give for what percentage of each startup. They ought to call it Mega Bucks. It must be a great place for tips. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Are the tips good here? They're excellent. Uh. Venture capitalists, you love them or you loathe them, but if you need money for your pet idea, you can't ignore them. These digital temples, monuments to the success of information technology, all needed venture capital to leave their garages behind. For all of them, it began with the occasion which strikes fear into the heart of every Silicon Valley entrepreneur. This is the mating dance of Silicon Valley. Entrepreneurs with business plans perform for venture capitalists with bags of money to invest. Each needs the other, yet it's the VCs who decide whether or not to mate. They call this dance the pitch, and it can mean the difference between failure and a billion dollar IPO. Some entrepreneurs do this dance a hundred times and never raise anything. Mike and I left because what we wanted to do was to bring um, electronic communication of information to the world. We are the outsourced messaging service for the Internet. Despite cautionary tales and horror stories that could outdo both Grimm and Aesop, this is a scene which is played out thousands of times a year in front of venture capitalists. It seems like you co-found a bunch of great things and then you bail out. Is it just that you... Well, I don't think, you ten, years, I don't think ten years is bailing out. <laughs> It's horribly repetitive for everyone. Nine out of ten pitches fail. 
But just occasionally, a venture deal presents itself which looks like a sure thing. For example, McAfee Associates in 1990. We had $15 million in the bank and five employees and a run rate of a burn rate of $300,000 a year. So we didn't need money. We needed advice. And so we took on the two venture partners and certainly it was the best deal they'd ever done. And, and for me, I, I didn't get hurt either. They turned it into a real company. It just strikes me as a kind of layperson here that fifteen million dollars in the bank is a real business. Uh, well, it, it, it is and it isn't. It depends on it, it's you know it, it depends on how you want to measure yourself. Yeah, yeah. They invested uh, ten million dollars, and I believe from my last conversations with TA and Summit that it was the largest deal in terms of net results that they have, they have ever done. Yeah. Each of them netted over a hundred million dollars on this. So they they each put in five million bucks and, and each got a hundred million out. You know, as much of a bad reputation as VCs have, they are in fact sharks. Uh, there's no question. But once they're on your side, they're your sharks. They're, they're your sharks. <laughs> um, and and it's like wow, you know. So you know, you, if if you struggle with them and if you can come out, you know, bleeding as little as possible and survive, then you're you're in you're in Fat City. John McAfee pulled off the final coup in startup business, the exit strategy of selling his company for a couple of hundred million dollars. Now there has to be a way for a geek like me to get access to venture capital. Back in Silicon Valley, there's naturally a very Californian way of conducting business. Here instead of three martini luncheons, these VCs play ultimate frisbee. That's co-ed American football with a frisbee instead of a ball. But forget about the rules. I've come up with a great cringely get-rich-quick scheme. i got to get some money. I'm going to network with these guys. You take Tracy, and I'll take the guy. I don't know who Tracy is. She's the only girl over. Oh! Never underestimate. I know. So stay on her. She's good. She's fast. As I set out to test my ultimate frisbee skills, I also had ringing in my ears the wise advice of one of the Valley's most renowned venture capitalists, John Doerr. Caesar said all of Gaul is divided into three parts. Well, all of risk is divided into four parts. There are really four risks you've got to look for in every project. The first is people risk. That is, how the team is going to work together because invariably one of the founders doesn't work out and falls out, which is why you want their options or equity to vest. The second risk is market risk, and that's incredibly expensive risk to remove. That's about whether or not the dogs are going to eat the dog food. Is there a market for this product? And by the time you get the product to market, you may have expenses of a million dollars a month. You don't want to be wrong about market risk. I get no. I get real. The third risk that we're quite willing to take on is a technical risk. That's about whether or not we can make a pen computer that works, or be the first to commercialize a web browser, or to uh, split the atom, if you will. That technical risk is one we're comfortable uh, trying to eliminate and take on. The fourth and final risk is financial risk. If you have all of the preceding three right, can you then get to the capital that you need to go grow the business? And uh, uh, typically you can. There's plenty of capital to finance uh, rapidly growing new technologies that are addressing uh, uh, large markets. Sorry, Bob, your idea sucks. We're not funding it. <laughs> There's this myth that Silicon Valley companies are always started in garages, but there are other options. The biggest company in the networking business, for example, was started in a living room in this house where Len Bozak and Sandy Lerner used to live. They were Stanford academics, but they were in different departments on different computer networks and unable to send email messages like, did you feed the cat? So they invented a way of networking networks with things called routers. The company they started in 1983, Cisco Systems, today does $10 billion a year in business. Routers created great wealth for the Cisco founders, Sandy Lerner and her former husband, Len Bozak. Their story is a classic nerd saga that started by accident and ended in a boardroom drama that many company founders have experienced to their cost. Was it your, your love of computers and networking that drew you two together? Or he had great legs, or what? 
You know, I'll just have to tell you something that's so bizarre, you'll just have to assume that it's true. Len's mother had done this miraculous job, and Len actually knew how to bathe and eat with silverware, and I was absolutely enchanted. You know, he used to take risk and, like, wash his collars and cuffs, which was way more than I ever did, and I just, I just didn't think that a more perfect man could exist. Let's meet Len Bozak and find out about his work ethic. Sincerity begins uh, at a little over 100 hours a week. You can probably get to 110 on a sustained basis, but it's hard. You have to get down to eating once a day and showering every other day, things of that sort, to, to really get uh, your life organized to work 110 hours a week. And the, and, and the level that follows sincerity, uh, what do we call that? Commitment. Len was a brilliant network technologist. Here he is, hard at work, in a snapshot from Sandy's Cisco scrapbook. It was do-it-yourself networking. If you wanted it, you had better do it yourself because no one else was going to do it for you. You couldn't buy it. We basically pulled wire through manholes. We pulled wire through disused sewer pipe. Um, we built a lot of things by ourselves. I mean, it was very, very much, a, at that point, a, a guerrilla action. We had no money, and we certainly didn't have any official sanction. Um, in the end, I guess the university was kind of allowed not to like it, but they did get a network out of it. The Stanford campus was 16 square miles. In 1984, its 5,000 computers were grouped in their own networks in separate buildings. Like islands, they needed causeways or bridges to connect them into a campus-wide network. We first built some bridges and then we built some crude routers and then we built better routers and that solved for Stanford the same sort of problem that it solved uh, 10 years earlier for ARPA, how to use a computer anywhere you wanted. On the digital highway, packets are blasting this way and that, going from network to network on the way to their ultimate destinations. At every point where one network is linked to another, there's a box called a router. Think of a router as a traffic cop. Like the cop, a router does three things. It stops traffic, it starts traffic, and it gives directions. So routers keep local packets from leaving their own network and clogging the internet. Internet packets they let go through and even give them directions to the next router. What routers don't do is eat donuts or give tickets. Once Glenn and Sandy had solved Stanford's networking problem, they saw an opportunity to offer the solution to other users. But Stanford didn't want to do it. And so we kind of really tried to get them to license the technology to these other universities and they just were not going to do it um, and so with tears in our eyes we took our five dollars up to the you know, Secretary of State's office in San Francisco and made Cisco Systems and took it anyway. So how did you go about it? Well in the same tradition that uh, anyone else in the Gulch does uh, you go out and buy a bunch of parts and try and make the stuff and uh, then go sell it and uh, solve the problems that come up. That are Len and Sandy's dedication wasn't in question. This archival gem from 1989 may be a little low on production values, but it shows just how single-minded these two were. In part, the result of some fairly unsophisticated. Well. That's very interesting. That wasn't the Wellfleet Marketing Department bombing the Cisco premises. That was a genuine San Francisco earthquake. Looks like Not even an earthquake could divert their attention from the glorious business of routers and bridges. So the Cisco headquarters was their house. The technology was, well, borrowed from Stanford, and their operating budget was plastic. You sort of... Uh spend against your credit cards and hope that the checks come in from your customers fast enough to uh, meet your uh, expenditures. How did you decide how much to charge for your for your products? We guessed. Now how big a business could you build on your credit cards? About a half a million dollars a month. Well, one bedroom was uh, the lab, uh, another bedroom was uh, office space, and when it was time to build and test something, well that was the living room. We financed the company on credit cards. We were turned down by 70 or 80 venture capitalists. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty touch and go. There's a downside to VC involvement. 
For all that money, they expect to own most of the company, to sit on the board, to tell you whom to hire, to generally question the competence of the founder to run the company. It can end in tears. Don Valentine was venture capitalist number 77, and his previous investments show that he understood the potential of this business. We knew from the experiences at Apple and at 3Com that the world was going to be connected. At that point, I think we were, Cisco was doing, I think, I think a quarter million, maybe maybe 350,000 a month uh, without a professional sales staff and without an uh, official conventionally recognized marketing campaign. So it wasn't a bad business just right then. And so I think just for the novelty of it, uh, the folks at Sequoia listened to us. We ended up taking money from Don Valentine and Sequoia Capital, who's a very savvy player. And Len and I were not, and I think that's probably about the best way to to put that. Don does just what he does. He has a formula and he executes against it. And that doesn't make him a good or a bad guy, just what he is. The commitment we jointly made to each other is that we at Sequoia would do a number of things. We'd provide the financing, we would find and recruit management, and we would help create a management process none of which existed in the company when we arrived. Sandy and I agreed to a forfeiture contract, a type of indentured servitude, where if we didn't do what the company asked, they would have the right to repurchase the shares that we actually already owned. We ended up with a four-year vesting agreement and 30% of the stock in the company and no employment contract. And I would strongly advise anybody watching this program not to do it that way. How should they do it? Well, certainly get your own lawyer. Sandy and Len soon discovered what many entrepreneurs before them have learned, that the company you founded is no longer the place you work. It was August 28, 1990, but who's counting? Okay, and what, what happened that day? Well, quite simply, I got fired. We had discussed uh, this event in that sooner or later the venture capitalists always want to get rid of the founders. That's just part of Don's formula. Both were very critical and helpful people to launching Cisco. No question about it. Len is a very, very good technician and recognizes that he has little interest or little ability in management and positions himself accordingly. So in the company, he was the chief technical officer. Sandy, who is a person very committed to a number of aspects of business is or was very acutely sensitive to how well the customers were treated. Don's opening words to me, you know, the first time I ever met that man, I wouldn't have known him from the man on the moon, where I hear you everything that's wrong with Cisco. Um, you know, I'm also the reason why there is a Cisco. What went wrong back at the ranch? Well, the end of the story is that one day, with the president, John Morgridge's prior approval, seven vice presidents of Cisco Systems showed up in my office. We had a, a reasonably civil meeting in our conference room, the outcome of which was a very simple alternative. Either I relented and allowed the president to fire Sandy Lerner, or they, all seven, would quit. It was probably time for Len and I to go. Um, you know, and that Len and I do not have company personalities, and I think we, we were finding it difficult to work in a larger organization. I think the way that it happened was wrong. The most regrettable thing, I would think, from their point of view, is they lost perspective and urgently sold their shares in Cisco at a time when the valuation of the company was a mere $1 billion or so. Had they somehow or other suffered this outrage with a little more financial wisdom, they might have sold when the company's market value was $10 billion or $20 billion or maybe even now at $56 billion. The pain of not having $18 billion must be slightly lessened by the pleasure of having $100 million to your name. 
what to do with all that money. Sandy Lerner's foundation acquired the manor house in the English village where Jane Austen wrote her novels. This came up for sale in 1992, and I for some very illogical reason bought it thinking that it would be just a wonderful place for the center for the study of early English women's writing. Today Sandy is also the proprietor of a successful nail polish empire, Urban Decay, which specializes in grunge colors called bruise, mildew, and acid rain. Whatever would Jane think? Pride and prejudice or sense and sensibility? Len Bozak now runs a Seattle technology company. His charitable donations fund the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Len is not kidding. He's serious about the universe. Very, very serious. It's one of the most important questions that a sentient being can ever formulate, and that is, are we alone? Either answer, if you could obtain it, is of tremendous import. But you surely do not expect little green men to come and present you with a message. On the other hand, if you don't listen, if you don't in any organized way ask the question of the universe, what if it has an answer waiting for you? Think of what you've missed. Len and Sandy left the company when it was worth a billion dollars. Today, Cisco Systems is worth 60 billion dollars. In the intervening years, Cisco and its competitors went from steady to spectacular to incredible rates of growth, much of it fueled by the next great internet invention, the World Wide Web. And look what became of Len and Sandy's living room. and this is 3Com Park, home of the San Francisco Giants. It's the last game of the regular season, and the Giants have already clinched the National League West Championship. They used to call this Candlestick Park, and now it's named for 3Com, a company that made its millions by plumbing the Internet. Now, thanks to the growth of cyberspace, their bits and bytes have bought them the best bats and balls. This series is all about the internet and the wired world and about the geeks and nerds who largely by accident invented it, making billions and billions of dollars along the way. And that's all it takes to put your name on a ballpark. information revolution. It's changing the way we live and work, and the pace is awesome. Four years ago, three million people used the internet. Today, it's a hundred million. By the year 2005, it could be a billion. Even if you don't own a PC, have never gone online, and think a website has something to do with spiders, the internet is transforming your world. If you don't believe it, just look what's already happening. Well, you've heard about the information age. It's here. It's the internet. It's the web. It's happening right in front of us. It's, it's a privilege to be here watching it happen because I've been worrying about it for decades. The internet boom hasn't even started. I mean, people are all, you know, geeked up about it, but we're just beginning to scratch. I think we're in the roaring 20s. For the true believers, the internet is much more than an electronic novelty. They have adopted a web lifestyle. The cheerleaders of this new revolution are staking their companies on all of us following their lead. You're living a web lifestyle 
when you just take it for granted that any purchase you make, any new thing you want to plan like a trip, you turn to the web as part of that process. Uh, people today live a phone lifestyle and a car lifestyle. And they almost laugh when you say that to them because it's just so taken for granted. A web lifestyle means living in the fast lane where time seems as compressed as the data in the wires and change is the only constant. Take this building south of Market Street in San Francisco. Five years ago, it was mostly derelict. Now it's been colonized by young internet entrepreneurs. But for how long? Aha! <laughs> Things have changed. Yes, we're on the moon now. Hey, hey, By the time this show airs, this San Francisco neighborhood will no longer be the hippest and hottest place in the digital world. That's because in the wired world, products and fashions change at warp speed. Time? Time is measured in dog years. I'm physically 35, and um, my last year was a full net year, which is about seven regular years. About, it's about a dog year, right? Yeah. So that means that, you know, 35 plus seven, so I'm virtually 42. Right, so basically since I kind of feel 42, since I live so hard, I may as well have my midlife crisis and get it all over with, right? Ride a motorcycle, right? Date a young guy. In internet time, there are no secrets, there's no time for delay, there are plenty of competitors who are going to eat you alive. You need to not take a breath and start over and do it again as soon as you get done the, you know, you know, with one. And you need to juggle three or four of these all the time. That's how you compete and survive if you're in the software business. Uh, on the internet. In the web universe, the person with two years experience has gotten more experience in web years than uh, someone who's got 20 years of the previous generation of programming. Uh, it's a bit of an overstatement, but um, web years, you know, are a wonderful curiosity to the general public and an uh, actual health threat to those who work in the industry. Well, I've been in the net for three years, and mm -hmm. three years ago I was 41, so 41 and 21 makes me 62. You're a senior citizen. <sighs> Today's kids are growing up wired. The information revolution is just part of everyday life. 70% of American schools now have access to the Internet. Take Edwin Chu. I first met him in 1995. Even then, he knew exactly where he was headed. What do your friends think of you? Boy, he's a nerd. Yeah. But I don't mind. I'm used to being called a nerd. Can't have other people stop your dreams. Hey, Edwin. Hi. Hey, what's up? Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Edwin is an inventor. He's made a laser pointer from a dental floss box, and he's designed the go-ped. It's a combination of a go-kart and a moped, because a moped has two wheels, and a go-kart's got four, and this one's got three, and it's right in the middle. Kevin, it's a... Go-ped. Go-ped. The front end of this looks like uh, some sort of... Uh, that, was, that was my sister's old tricycle. She never used it. I made it into something actually useful. Edwin was born in 1985 in the PC generation. His talent for technology may make him a future entrepreneur, but otherwise he's a typical American teenager. His world is being shaped by the Internet and the Web at a pace you have to experience to believe. Yep, this thing's fully charged and ready to go. He's left me in his dust. Go, Edmund. He's gone. He's gone. Nothing illustrates the incredible rate of change in the Internet better than the story of six young guys I first met with four years ago in that garage. Straight out of Stanford University, they started a company then called Architects, and I've been coming back every year to watch them grow. And have they grown? The company, now called Excite, is worth more than a billion dollars. Let's flash back to that first meeting in 1994. It's hard to look beyond. We need a demo, and we need it now. Usually, at the core, there's 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 one guy with you know minimal social skills, but just amazing <laughs> yeah, brain. Yeah, he's one got. Uh, <laughs> he has great oh, yeah. social skills. Oh, he has great social skills. <laughs> here you are. Well, 
How's it going? <laughs> how, is it, how is it like working with these semi-incompetents? <laughs> they're, they're all quite competent. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. How much so far has this all cost? $2,000 maybe? You still have money in the bank? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We're frugal. <laughs> We're really frugal. <laughs> it's amazing. That's why the rice. That's the, that's the, that's the rice. Exactly. <laughs> I'll return to the architect's boys to see how they get on, but already they were smart enough to see that information technology was going to be a big business. The PC was the largest single legal creation of wealth we've ever seen on the planet. So I figured right now we're into year three of the web, and by my calculation, the new companies, not the existing ones, but the new web companies, are worth more than forty billion dollars and that's uh, four times what the PC companies were worth at this point in the decade of the PC this is not a hula hoop, it's not a fad hey aren't the experts saying that very few internet businesses are profitable well that's true right now but in cyberspace these are pioneer days and the land rush has just begun still there are a few early stakeholders who have already hit pay dirt Maybe it was inevitable that the first moneymaker on the internet would be sex. After all, that's what got movies and videos started. Welcome to the Peep Show for the Information Age, a new take on an old trick. Nowadays, thanks to the interactive assets of the internet, you can see exactly what you want, or more accurately, what you pay $5.99 a minute for. So, Kat, you're part of the uh, the adult uh, internet industry. Yes, I am. Do, do you feel like a pioneer? Uh, yes, actually, I like this new venue. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm getting a fresh start, like right at the beginning of it, and there's a lot of open doors. On the web, you can't handle the merchandise, but that hasn't prevented the greatest of all American inventions, shopping, from entering cyberspace. No surprise to find that the World Wide Web has become a virtual mall. One of the first virtual stores to build a real business is a virtual bookstore. This is Amazon.com, the brainchild of Jeff Bezos. He figured out that books were the ideal internet product because you don't need to touch before you buy. So Jeff rented a giant warehouse in Seattle, hired a bunch of Generation X bibliophiles, and ships the books which customers order from Amazon's website. So far, Amazon hasn't made a profit, but it's valued at more than a billion dollars. Clearly, a lot of investors think Jeff's internet idea is hot. There's a sort of a fundamental irony that we're using bits to sell atoms. And, yeah, it's, it's a little wacky. But it works, and it's extremely efficient, and people recognize the value of it. A year after we visited the architects' boys in their grungy garage, they'd gone through the VC experience and moved into a real office. The boys were a year older and five years wiser. Working 100 hours a week can do that to you. The venture capitalist who backed the architect's dream was Vinod Koshla. Now, what made me spend five or $10,000 on 15 minutes on five guys, or really two guys, so, Joe Krauss uh, and Graham free Spencer, free who I was meeting for the first time, who had never had a job, never had any success, had completely crazy notions of what applications they wanted to pursue. There was something about them that said to me, they are good entrepreneurs. They were good listeners. They were good debaters. They were thoughtful about my comments. They didn't give in to everything I said. They didn't disagree with everything I said. And I really liked the vibrations, the wipes. They were really good wipes. These are the five sentences that are statistically most relevant to the document. A moat it is to trouble the mind's eye. That's pretty deep. <laughs> Let's leave Graham for the moment. That is, that Summarizing is. Shakespeare has its uses, but the web has a lot more to offer, like replacing the post office and the telephone. The web is incredibly exciting because it is the, the fulfillment of a lot of our dreams that the computer would ultimately not be primarily a device for computation, but metamorphosize into a device for communication. And the, with the web, that's finally happening. 
Um, and secondly, it's exciting because Microsoft doesn't own it, and therefore there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening. Welcome. You've got mail. And the tool for communication is email, baby. That's number one. I must get, you know, I probably get 100 pieces of email a day. But at least 30 of them nowadays come from outside. They come from, hey, but I haven't seen you since you and I were in school together in fifth grade in Belgium. Do you remember me? <laughs> Dear Steve, life's a beach. Wish you were here. <laughs> I'm sending an email to Steve Ballmer, who obviously likes receiving them. This will be one of the 100 million email messages that go out over the Internet today. Email is the information revolution up close and personal. For more and more people, it's the way to communicate. You can send everything that you would put in a telephone conversation or a letter, and usually do it faster, cheaper, and it's global. There. That saves a postcard. Thanks to email and computer bulletin boards, the Internet has created virtual communities, far-flung groups of people with a shared interest. Boston writer Fawn Fitter joined The Well, one of the oldest electronic meeting places, where she has met, talked, and argued with kindred souls, and even fallen in love. I had this computer, and I went out and bought this modem, and I got online, and I was just blown away, absolutely, because I realized that here was this literally community of, you know, at the time probably about 5,000 people who were not just talking about sex or trying to pick each other up or whatever, um, that they were having actual conversations about actual things that I was interested in. I will confess that when I first got online, I had a little cyber fling and um, the thing about online romances is that because you aren't actually with the person, you can project anything you want onto them. And then when reality slaps you in the face, it can either be a real wake-up call or it can work out wonderfully. I was just blown away by the style and fluency of this person's written communications. And then when we met in person, it just became apparent that he wasn't quite as fluent with emotional interchange. I'm not slamming him. He's a good guy. It's, he's just not the one for me. And I don't think of having met him online as being all that very different from having met him at a party or in a bar or through a personal zat or rollerblading down the sidewalk. Back to those architects, guys. When I caught up with him again in 1997, what a transformation! They changed the name of the company to Excite, moved to a bigger office, and have even done some cool TV advertising. If you can just get your mind together, then come on across to me. They used their venture funding to recruit a real CEO, what in the Valley we call adult supervision. So it's a very odd situation you know, when you come into, into a, a deal where you're interviewing with a 24-year-old or a 23-year-old guy at the time and trying to sort of puff your chest out about all the things you've accomplished and all you've done. And here's a 23-year-old guy who's sort of well on his way to being a millionaire or a multiple millionaire um, and who's got a very good view of business already at the age of 23. And he was not alone among the other founders. They also were very sophisticated in other ways. Most important of all, the company had gone public. After just three years, each of these 20-somethings was worth about $10 million and had money to spend. Bought a new phone. Bought a new phone. StarTac phone. I love that phone. Uh, and I bought a camera. This is sort of my other new toy, which is uh, just small. Take pictures. Try to take one picture a day in my life and record it. Um, a phone? A, a camera? That's it? Didn't you buy like a, a car? A car. Mm. I bought a car. I heard you bought a house. I, just yesterday. That's right. <laughs> what a big step. That's grown Huge up. Huge step. That's a very grown up. I had a hard time making a decision because I wanted to get, I wasn't going for a luxury mobile. I wasn't going for a Porsche or anything like that. But I wanted a pretty nice car. And I wanted lots of gadgets. I like gadgets in my cars. But the problem was that I'm also vegetarian, so I didn't want leather seats in my car. And so 
what I discovered as I was shopping for cars was that there are almost no car manufacturers who put all the gadgets in a version of their car without leather seats. So you can either have leather seats and gadgets or no leather seats and no gadgets. And so it was a big dilemma for me to try to pick the right vehicle that had the features I wanted and the seats that I wanted. So you get rich and you get a white Volkswagen. Right. Isn't this nice? I figured it's sort of the retro thing. Round headlights, trunk in front, good four cylinders. I'm really sort of jealous of this car, though. Yeah? A friend of mine bought this one. Yeah, don't nice, give me that. Nice BMW Don't give M3. me that. This is yours, Ooh, isn't it? Tree Sam. It is. It is. It's a fun little car. So when Cars, phones, it, houses. Just some of the rewards for the young geek the smart enough to exploit no, the world's it, latest so revolution. Seven months ago. The revolution being created by the Internet is different from all previous ones. It's abolishing distance. This is my garage. A few years ago, I'd get in my car here and drive to the office. But today, thanks to the Internet, it is my office. In fact, it's the headquarters for my intergalactic business empire. With my computer plugged into the Internet, I run two software companies, write my column for PBS, and attempt to manage my life. It's a revolution, all right, and you know what? We owe it all to the Russians. The race to the new frontier, outer space, was the new sensation of 1957. Up through the fast thinning atmosphere, the climb into the space void. From the desolate... It began with Sputnik, the, the satellite launched by the USSR in 1957. Sputnik caused a worldwide sensation and sent shockwaves through the U.S. administration. It forced two presidents into action. Their separate initiatives both paid off years later in 1969. President Eisenhower created an agency called ARPA to fund high-powered scientific and space research. Being an army man, he made the Pentagon responsible. So, obscure academics suddenly found themselves on the Cold War's front line. The money we spend yearly without putting a single weapon in our arsenal is $5 billion, $200 million. It created a considerable stir. It was clear that the area that we had chosen to work in uh, was going to get more attention. And science, for a long time before that, had not had a particularly good name. It had not been a big deal. And I think there was some realization that it maybe was important after all. All pre-start panel lights are correct. The ready light is on. President Kennedy's challenge to the Russians was to commit America to putting a man on the moon. He gave that project to NASA, the civilian agency. By now, it had taken over from the Pentagon responsibility for space research. Godspeed, John Glenn. Ten, nine, eight, seven. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. As NASA launched America's first astronauts, Pentagon scientists decided computers had the right stuff. Compared with the high-profile moon missions, computer research was something of a Cinderella. Throughout the 1960s, it was the space race which got all the media's attention. The computers of the 60s were the size of small apartments. Their use was strictly rationed and only a few people got anywhere near them. Still, a visionary psychologist at MIT, J.C.R. Licklider, known to all as Lick, saw their growing potential. The computer technology has been moving in a way that nothing else people have ever known has moved. Here's a field that gets a thousand times as good in 20 years. Lick had this concept of the intergalactic network, which he uh, believed was uh, everybody could use computers anywhere and get out data anywhere in the world. Specialized hardware facilities tend to be expensive but very efficient. On the other hand, if they can be distributed, then specialized hardware facilities can be very effective and can let us do things that we couldn't otherwise do. Lick was thinking big about the future of networking at a time when there was only a handful of computers anywhere in the world, and decades before the personal computer would arrive. The vision was really Lick's, 
in, in, in originally. I mean, any, none of us can really claim to have seen that before him, nor anybody in the world. I mean, Luke saw this vision in, in the early 60s. He didn't have a clue as how to build it. You know, <laughs> he didn't have any idea what to do to make this happen. By the mid-60s, the Gemini program was regularly sending American astronauts into orbit. On Earth, ARPA was funding mainframe computers for research at major universities. Mainframes were too big and expensive for personal use. But in keeping with the communal spirit of the times, a system was devised to provide more people with computer access. It had the science fiction name, Time Sharing. Many users were connected to the same computer, and the user had the illusion, in any, every, every individual user had the illusion that the computer was... For all the outward differences, India's Silicon Valley has a lot in common with my Silicon Valley, starting with traffic jams and construction everywhere. The street signs and billboards are all in English. Bangalore is busy and booming because of the huge numbers of programmers and Western companies are putting to work. The Internet has become a worldwide digital communication network that rivals in size the telephone system. So here we are, 12,000 miles, 12 time zones away from where I live in Silicon Valley in California, in Bangalore, the Silicon Valley of India. Programmers here solve the problems of users around the world. Companies founded here serve customers in Europe and the United States. And it all happens because of the Internet. So, so what we have done is to set up a uh, um, company here, the kind of investment which you, which you see or which you have made, oh, yeah. with a clear approach to do work in India, leverage those skills, develop those technology skills in India, so that we leverage that for Novell. Novell, the netware company from Utah, is constructing a new Indian headquarters building here. 21st century technology built by pre-industrial labor. We work with uh, GE, General Electric, almost all the units of GE, uh -huh. uh, Allied Signals, uh, Sequent, uh -huh. Xerox, Putnam Investor Services in Boston, uh -huh. uh, Tandem, Cisco, Stratacom. Sundar Sankaran is a typical young programmer in Bangalore. Sundar offered to take me to work with him on the back of his motor scooter. Apparently, every one of his fellow programmers had exactly the same idea. They say that in Bangalore, every second person writes code, and everybody honks at the traffic lights. Honking is a major pastime out here. So you tend to get bored, you generally honk for some time. <laughs> Makes you feel nice. <laughs> In India, we have a computer as part of the curriculum. Now it starts in class 3, grade 3 as we would call it. Uh -huh. So I've been doing some kind of programming or other since uh, class 8. When I was there, it was class 8. Uh -huh. So once I finished my bachelor's, I got into a non-formal institute for computer learning. And then started uh, programming. Programmers in Bangalore are awake when America is asleep. The internet has perfected the 24-hour workday. <laughs> yes. You're working when your customer is sleeping. Uh -huh. Okay, to that extent, if he gives you a problem during his working hours, you solve it and send it back to him by the time he starts working. So, I mean, it's, it's a great advantage, especially if you're doing things offshore. We get a call in the evening through email saying there's a problem. Next day morning when people come to the US, problem is solved. Uh -huh. While the customer gets surprised saying, well, I just told you at 5 o'clock in the evening, how come in the morning you guys solved it? Now the problem is solved in the other part of the world by really using this 24-hour development cycle. It's not only cricket the British Empire gave India, it also made English the language of government and higher education, which gives Indian engineers another great advantage. People here know English, unlike Japan or China and places like that. People know English, you know, so that is the lingua franca of, you know, software. You have to know English. My kids uh, study in an uh, English medium school. They cannot uh, read or write my own, own mother tongue, which I'm able to do it, but the next generation is not able to do that. 
same way you'll find that Indians don't have pr problem speaking of languages. They can speak French, they can speak, you know, Belgian probably, you know. Most of languages, people going from here, they pick up very easily. For an American, especially an American from Silicon Valley, it's almost impossible to imagine India as a high technology development center. I mean, just look around. This, this is amazing. The average person in an Indian school learns at least three languages, English, Hindi, and their local language. Some of them know five or six. Compare that to American students. Think about it in terms of computer languages. What are they? They have uh, syntax, they have characters, they have objects, they have verbs. What's it in between C++ and Hindi? Not all that much, really. They have a 5,000-year tradition of mathematics, which we don't. After the World Wide Web and the browser, there's a third breakout invention that's driving the expansion of the web lifestyle. It's called Java, a network programming language named after the valley's favorite fuel. Like the others, it's helped make the internet easier to use for anyone, anywhere, and with any kind of computer. Because the internet grew in such a haphazard way, the computers on it used many different programming languages. This wasn't a problem when the networks were separate, but when the World Wide Web made it possible for them to communicate, there had to be a way to make it easy. A guy named James Gosling came up with the answer. He invented a language that would run the same on any computer, one size fit it all, which was good for business. And like everything else on the internet, it had a strange name, Java. Maybe he drank too much coffee while working on his invention. Better than naming it Budweiser. One of the most brilliant programmers on the planet, Bill Joycosm, the greatest programmer in the world, came to my office one day because I'd heard he was upset. And I said, James Gosling, what, what's the matter? Why aren't you happy? This was like in the early 90s. And he says, I'm tired of dealing with all this old legacy computer environment. It's just for a great programmer, it's, it's kind of like trying to fly by flapping your wings. And he said, I want to go out and create a new environment. It was conceived way back in 1990, 91 time frame um, by a few engineers at Sun Microsystems who wanted to create a better, uh, better world uh, in terms of software delivery, software um, deployment. And they were imagining consumers being plugged into this network world. What they didn't realize at the time was it was the internet, it was going to be the internet. What's Java? I mean, Java is a building material. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like concrete. It's something that you can use to build software out of. But it's a material that's got some, some pretty different properties. The one that has sort of gotten the most airtime and most people hear about is write once, run anywhere, or being architecture neutral, uh, where you can sort of write a program once and it will actually run on different machines. Um, and it can rove across the network. And I said, hey, I don't care what you want to do. Whoever you want to do it, whenever, how long, however long, with whoever, for as much money, I'll set you up in a room, I'll give you all the raw meat and jolt cola and potato chips you want, anything you need, for as long as you want, just go do something great. He said, really? I said, yeah, now get out of here. So he went off, we set him up in downtown Palo Alto, and they started hiring a bunch of really great people, and they... You know, it was kind of like Groundhog Day. They'd come out every now and then, they'd look around, and I'd look and see what they had, and I'd go, I don't get it. And they'd go, okay, so they'd go back in. Certainly early on, I don't think Scott had a good idea what it was about or what it was for. Uh, you know, it was sort of this, this group of, you know, rabble-rousers off in the corner doing something really odd that he didn't know how it related to their main business. Um, and, you know, the truth is that, at, you know, in the early times, it didn't relate to the main business. Everyone knows that if you go to the computer store, you have to buy software that runs on Windows or a different piece of software that runs on the Mac. With Java, you can take a single program and it will run on both and it will run on both well. That opportunity was created because of the, the Internet. Because the Internet is a mixed network and it doesn't make sense to have 20 versions of your software on a single server. So the promise of the Internet coincided just at the right time with the great inventions by people like James Gosling in the language. It's taken the world by storm. It, uh, it's very clearly now going to be in some 300 million computers just three years from now. I think there's 200 books on the market right now on Java, 4 million programmers programming in it, and it's uh, only 700 days old. So that's 
phenomenal. I've done many things that have gotten very popular, but amongst a very sort of nerdy community. Um, because the, the kind of stuff I do is stuff that I have no idea how to explain it to my mom. And, and or even explain, you know, even at a high level why it's interesting to my mom. And so it tends to stay in a fairly closed community. And to have something that has touched people's everyday lives um, surprised them, surprised me. The 1990s internet has spun off two significant challenges for Bill Gates. Both Netscape's browser and Sun's programming language Java were not invented at Microsoft. Bill was slow to see the challenge at first, then he took action. Here on the shore of Lake Washington near Seattle stands a monument to Bill Gates' brilliance, or at least to his money. The last time anyone tried to estimate, Bill's new house was going to cost $50 million. But over the last two years, his wealth has increased at a rate of $31 million per day. So no matter what it costs, it doesn't matter. Bill Gates didn't get to be the richest man in the world just because he's smart or just because he's lucky. It's because he's smart and lucky and knows it and pushes his every advantage to the limit. Bill had largely ignored the Internet. How could a non-commercial network offer a business opportunity? But by 1994, there was a growing buzz about the web and Netscape, especially among new Microsoft recruits fresh from college. At the urging of the troops, Bill went surfing. It was an all-nighter that changed Microsoft and the Internet industry. Bill went down to his place on the uh, Hood Canal and with instructions on how to get on and what to go look for. And he got on and started looking around and then started just going from site to site and I think eventually spent the greater part of all night on the, on the net and came back and had a meeting and described that, uh, the experience and said that uh, he was kind of blown away with just how much was really there. Well, we always assumed that Microsoft would be our biggest enemy um, because they would have to uh, turn their attention to this. Uh, we got lucky for a while in that they just they weren't paying attention. Um, there were people inside Microsoft who knew what Microsoft should do to respond to us, but the, the management team at Microsoft was sort of almost willfully ignoring what was happening. Gates is a smart guy. Unlike the management of IBM in the middle 80s, Bill Gates is awake and functioning. And he noticed that the Internet was not going to be ignored. He tried to ignore it briefly. And then he saw it wasn't, quickly he saw, in time he saw that it wasn't going to be ignorable. What Bill Gates did was turn an industry super tanker on a dime. At first he didn't really get the internet, but once he did, he wrote a memo called The Coming Internet Tidal Wave and quickly refocused the entire company on responding to the new environment. It's like Henry Ford going into aircraft production or Boeing into pizza delivery, but it worked. Microsoft was ever building just in a new direction. Bill likes to have a general feeling of paranoia throughout the entire company as to you know, who's going to come along with something that's going to destroy one or all of our businesses. And so people are very receptive to um, an understanding of a, of a sudden direction change. When Bill finally says that, boy, we better do something about this, um, instantly people get it. I wrote a memo at one point called the Internet Tidal Wave that very explicitly said, you know, I've told you many times in the past, I think uh, the Internet is a, is a priority. I'm now telling you it is the priority. And the timing was very good there because we were getting along in terms of Windows 95. We thought we had that all well understood and we could really get a lot of energy focused on the Internet. Microsoft announced to the world their change of direction on a date with historic significance for Americans, Pearl Harbor Day. It was actually uh, Admiral Yamamoto who observed uh, that he feared they had but awakened a sleeping giant. We did a, a big event on uh, December 7th, must have been 1995, where we for the first time showed the world how this had all built up and they saw, hey, this is pretty dramatic. This company uh, is going to deliver great internet software. So that saying it was an epiphany is a little too much, but 
uh, saying that 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 it became the centerpiece of our strategy. That's absolutely right. You will hear from us that you know we're not forming an internet division. Uh, to us, that's you know it's like having an electricity division or uh, a software division. Uh, the internet is pervasive in everything that that we're doing. The big break happened at the famous Pearl Harbor Day talk, uh, um, but you know Microsoft was doing a bunch of stuff leading up to that. And in, fa in fact, they have this they have this this thing they do now, which is every three months they come out and say, you know, and reannounce how hardcore they are about the internet. And and so they've they've like done that like five or six times now. When the slumbering giant awoke, this was the result: Microsoft's own browser, the Internet Explorer, a product designed specifically to compete with Netscape Navigator. Funny, don't they look alike? But in 1996, there was a big difference between them. Netscape Navigator cost business users $49. Internet Explorer was free. They're working hard, as you can see here, implementing all the standards we need. And what, what do you think we'll charge for that? Like all the others, nothing. OK, well, that's, that's quite a deal. <laughs> Ours was always not free. It was freely downloadable. But if you were a business using it, you had to talk to Netscape about a licensing agreement. That was the way we felt we would be able to make money in the early days, and that was the way we made money. We made $75 million the first year in revenues and $375 million in the second year. The third year ended up, ended up being somewhere north of $500 million in revenues. And, and I, um, we did that by selling, getting, getting licenses for companies to make company-wide use of the browser. Microsoft's free Internet Explorer started taking market share from Netscape. To people who care about the market benefits of competition, that's a controversial thing to do. Giving it away is an anti-competitive technique. They're trying to kill Netscape by drying up its revenue sources. And it's, it should be illegal. They should not be permitted to do that. In, uh, if, if, there's, if any antitrust has any use, it's to go in now and say, you, call, you spend millions and millions of dollars to develop the thing and you give it away. Hmm. Why are you doing that? Clearly you're doing that to damage Netscape. You're not allowed to do that. Microsoft came along in an attempt to put us out of business, gave away the browser totally free, even to companies who wanted to use it for business, and it, it definitely had an impact on us. As a consequence, we had to give away, give away our browser. The results were just as the first exponent of giveaway software would have predicted. John McAfee. If you have two competing products and they are on a par in terms of functionality and usability, the free one is the one that will propagate. I may have the full Maybe that's why Microsoft is just a little sensitive about whether they are or are not giving their browser away. Well, Microsoft's never been accused of not knowing how to make money. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you can sell volume uh, software, you can do quite well. Now, in order to keep Windows very strong, we felt having a free browser that promoted our extensions, as well as providing all the power of, of all the other standards, that that was critical to our strategy. And so the browser investment is totally paid for by the fact that it helps Windows. And Windows is a very good, uh, quite profitable business. Do we give away software? I don't think so. so. Nobody ever told us we were giving away the print manager, the thing that lets you configure printers in Windows. It's just a built-in piece of Windows. The browser, similar, is really a built-in piece of Windows. Now, we sometimes update it when it's not time to update the rest of Windows. And so we basically sort of think, mm, let's make sure people get all those updates. But in point of fact, they're on our browser, you got to own Windows. So in a sense, while the browser itself may be free, we're getting paid. On May 18, 1998, the Microsoft Netscape dispute took on a new dimension. The U.S. government stepped into the fight. The Department of Justice filed an antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft alleging anti-competitive practices in the browser market. The Justice Department has charged Microsoft with engaging in anti-competitive and exclusionary practices designed to maintain its monopoly in personal computer operating systems and attempting to extend that monopoly to Internet browser software. 
The intervention of Uncle Sam into an industry which until now hasn't had much regulation is a seismic event in the history of the Internet. It may take years to resolve, but you know, I bet Microsoft even has plans to deal with regulatory earthquakes. Well, Netscape is the, is the leader, and Microsoft is the big... Microsoft's playing the role of IBM, if I might go back to the mid-'80s. So Microsoft is the big bumbling company who got taken by surprise with the Internet, and, my, and Netscape is the Microsoft <laughs> that switched roles. So Microsoft is now the dominant monopoly, which relies on, much too often, I think, on its size rather than its excellence to succeed. Well, Netscape's done a very good job, and you always expect new people to come along. I didn't know, you know what their name would be or who they would be, but they'll always be every year. Uh, companies that latch on to what the latest thing is and, and get a lot of visibility uh, and deliver products that relate to that. They're ruthless and vicious and if they decide they want the business you're in, ask anybody who's gone up against them directly. Now, in fact, of course, they weren't in our market when we started. So we were hardly going after a market that they were aware of, but they then realized it could be a big market. And, it's their God-given right to own any big market in software. When you're up against Bill Gates and his money, and he is following this strategy, the best bet is to get into another business. You know, just say, okay, forget it, I'll do something else in life. Because you cannot compete with that. So who will win this battle of the browsers? Well, Microsoft's Blitzkrieg has already taken a big bite out of Navigator's market share, forcing Netscape to match Microsoft's tactics and give their browser away. Is history repeating itself? Will Bill Gates own the Internet the way he already owns the PC universe? I don't think so. No one owns the Internet. And it's a big place, growing so fast, there's always room for someone with a dream, a taste for cola, and a willingness to go without sleep. Someone like Joe Krause of Excite. The 26-year-old tycoon gives me a tour of the new headquarters for his billion-dollar company. This is where I figured we filmed the death of Spock scene, okay? <laughs> so you put me in here, you put me in here, yeah. and you turn the halon on. Okay. The last line, Mel. Tell my wife, I love her. It's a new show. It's a, it's a show every 90 minutes. I'm like Shamu. <laughs> hey, you brought with you the alien baby. <laughs> you know, this is leaking. Security level 10. Uh -huh. we well, I like you like the garage door? You started in the nice garage. Time. Now you have a this, garage This door. conference room is actually called the garage. Uh-huh. Right? So we figure sort of hark back to our roots here in the garage. This is for executive caliber meetings. Who dons the bulb? The first time... We were with you guys was, I don't know, 94? Okay, right. Three years ago. 94 in another garage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I had a sense at that time, just a, just a, a little sense, that you basically had no idea what you were in, you know, up against. That hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> just looking around me and saying, wow, you know, we have all these fantastically dynamic people that we're working with, and, you know, this company exists here because of us, because of something that we started, and um, that's insanely gratifying. I was sort of listening to myself talk about this and think, wow, are we really successful at this point? Have we really gotten that big? So that now I'm telling small startup companies how to, you know, how to do the same thing. So I think that the remembering back to the garage helps keep uh, helps keep you paranoid because you realize how quickly things can go from garage to something like this and I think we all feel extremely proud and happy and uh, of, of what's been accomplished but I think that uh, it sort of reminds you that just as easily as you can make it here you can make it back to the garage <laughs> this is the Silicon Valley fairy tale and there are thousands more little gangs of dreamers eating burritos and working all night to make their fortunes in the wired world. So they was just serving that user. Mm -hmm. The computer was fast enough so it could serve you and move to the next person and the next person and the next person and come back to you and you didn't ever, uh, you were never aware of the fact that it left you.
The Internet and the World Wide Web were really born right here at the U.S. Pentagon, headquarters for the world's most powerful fighting force and home with the squarest jaws on the planet. A sack full of money was set aside to fund far-out scientific research as part of the so-called space race. Like most Pentagon projects, it had a strange acronym, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But DARPA had very little to do with defense and a great deal to do with the research interests of the people who controlled the money. As NASA achieved the first docking in space, Bob Taylor took over ARPA's responsibility for spending the Pentagon's budget for computer research. In most government funding, there are committees that decide who gets <coughs> what and who does what. And uh, in ARPA, we, that was not the way it worked. The person who was responsible for the office that was concerned with that particular technology, in my case, computer, technology was a person who made the decision about what to fund and what to do and what not to do. So um, the decision to start the ARPANET was mine, you know, with very little or no red tape. It's more than 30 years since Taylor worked in the endless nondescript halls of the Pentagon. And do you know, they have a speed limit in these corridors. A long way from Silicon Valley, light years from the Silicon Valley way of doing business, the campaign to build a national computer network began here. We're going to what was Bob Taylor's office, where the word went out to start wiring the world. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi, Bob Crinchley. Jim McKinney. Okay, Jim, do you know that the Internet was uh, invented, was founded right in this room? Uh, no, I did not. Well, you haven't redecorated either, as I can see. <laughs> so do you use the Internet in your work? Uh, we certainly do. Is it it doesn't look to? like much, but here stuff. Bob Taylor had a brainwave. How about networking all of ARPA's computers together? So he asked his boss, Charlie Hertzfeld, for a million dollars. And he got it. Can I get a job here? I was sitting in my office in the Pentagon, and to communicate with people at Santa Monica, I had to move to sit down at this terminal here. And if I wanted to talk with the people in or the computer in Berkeley, I had to get up from this terminal and go over and sit at another terminal, go through a different protocol, a different command language. The same for MIT. So it's, the obvious question is, wait a minute, why don't we have one terminal and have all of these places interconnected? It might not be an intergalactic network, but even interstate would be a huge step. The universities ARPA funded weren't enthusiastic about the so-called ARPANET. But many of the uh, people in charge of the computing facilities at these ARPA-supported places saw uh, the uh, ARPANET as a threat in the sense that it meant that someone from another part of the country would be using some of your precious computer time. Typical response was, why? I said, well, look, you, you know, you'll be part of a network, and you can use other people's networks, and they can use your other people's computers, you can, and they can use yours. I said, no, nobody can use mine. It's overloaded right, 100% right now. Don't touch me. Initially, some of the universities that had these host sites weren't incredibly enthusiastic. I mean, they would say, why do I want to use my computer? I'm busy enough right here. I don't want to share anything at that other guy's site anyway. We've got our own, uh, you know, uh, uh, fish to fry. People were totally unwilling to do it. However, each of these sites was being supported, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars a year by ARPA, and ARPA said, you're going to join this network. And sure enough, they did. <laughs> In 1968, the Apollo program succeeded Gemini and lunar missions began. Meanwhile, Bob Taylor was pushing his plan to link ARPA-funded mainframes at UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, and Stanford in California and the University of Utah. So ARPA issued a request for quotations to 140 technology companies. The brief was to invent the first ever digital computer network. Time for the Cringely Crash Course in Geek. That's modern geek, not ancient. Every revolution brings its own specialist vocabulary. I bet Alexander Graham Bell spent entire dinner parties explaining dial-a-joke. Well, the information revolution is no exception. It's brought whole new meaning to words like digital, packet, protocol, and browser. The key word is digital, and we can blame computers for that one.
A computer is just a box of switches, and switches are either off or on, represented by the numbers 0 and 1. Any information, no matter how long or complicated, coming from a computer can be represented by a string of those two digits, 0 and 1. That's why we call the process digital. It's not very original, but then computers aren't known for their imagination. Larry Roberts was chosen to draw up the request for quotations. He was an MIT computer scientist who became the chief architect of the ARPANET. Let's pause to consider the social habits of 1960s geeks like Larry and his friend and colleague, Len Kleinrock. These guys are applied mathematicians, and for fun and profit, they applied their mathematics to gambling. You're a gambler. I, I do when I, when I can win, when I know how to win. Do you know how to win? Well, at gambling, yes. I, <laughs> I know how to count. Larry and I always like puzzles, and we like challenges. And of course, Las Vegas presented a wonderful challenge. We were going after roulette. See, roulette is a wonderful game. It, it, it's a game where you lose a nickel on every dollar you bet, by and large, if it's fair. So we developed a system to just measure where the ball and the wheel were, calculate when it's going to fall in, and just, you just have to predict half the wheel, and you've got two to one odds in your favor. But we needed some data. And so I wanted to record the sound of the wheel and use the sound of the wheel and the Doppler shift of the sound of the wheel to find out when. And I went to another casino and I uh, tried to record it. So Larry put a microphone in his hand, a wire to a recorder inside his jacket, and wrapped his arm as if he had a broken arm. And he put his arm next to the wheel. And I was a decoy. I was there gambling and drawing, drawing attention to me. And Kleinrock sat there belling on the side. Well, he started winning. And the pit boss came by as he started showing him winning and me my bandaged hand near the wheel. And he said, now, what's wrong with your hand? And I said, well, I burned it. <laughs> and now the croupier started noticing me, and he saw Larry and me walking together. So I'm winning. I'm a buddy with Larry, and Larry's hand is right next to the wheel, wrapped up like a mummy. So this croupier takes Larry's broken arm and he yanks it. And he said, well, we'd like it. would you like it broken off? And so at that point, we decided we'd better leave. <laughs> Let's get back to New England, true birthplace of the information age. Not only is this the home of Captain Bubblehead and his amphibious assault craft, but in the 60s it was the hub of advanced computer research. Massachusetts is famous for much more than just the Boston Tea Party, which happened over there in Boston Harbor. It's also renowned for Boston's twin city across the river, Cambridge, home of two of the most high-powered scientific institutions in the world. But beyond Harvard and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there's another outfit often called the Third University on the Charles. It's a high-tech engineering company called BBNN for its founders, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. In 1968, BBN was ready to take its place in networking history. So let's meet some of the team who would unexpectedly change the world. Californian Dave Walden made juggling the hobby of choice around the ARPANET community. Frank Hart was a systems engineer from Yonkers with a reputation as a tough manager. Severo Ornstein, musician and rock climber, later founded Computer Scientists for Social Responsibility. This outfit was ready for the challenge issued from the Pentagon. BBN was aware for uh, some time before that that a bid was, uh, a request for proposal was coming. Bob Kahn in particular, who was one of our team, was aware of that. BBN put together a team of people to get ready to bid. So in fact, we were working on the bid before the request for proposal came out. Uh, planning, thinking, doing designs. So when the actual request for proposal came out, in some sense it was like doing the design a second time. It seemed we could build it, and I went in and told Frank, in words which I guess have become somewhat immortalized, that uh, sure we could build it, but I had no idea why anybody would want such a thing. Christmas 1968, the 
Apollo 8 astronauts became the first men to orbit the moon. PhD dissertation basically uncovered the underlying principles of packet switching, of message switching, of burst communications, of data networking. Here's another word from the Crimsley Glossary of Geek. Packet. And since this is the very foundation stone of the internet, please pay attention. We have two computers and they are connected to each other by a digital network. We want to send a message from one computer to the other. Do we send it as one big chunk or lots of little chunks? Well, it's much easier to put sand on a pipe than boulders, so I say little chunks. These chunks are called packets. And the first thing we do is we number them so we know their order in case they get out of sequence going over the network. And we add some extra information to them that says where they came from and where they're going. So that if, for example, there's a traffic jam along here, the network can redirect them through another computer. That's called packet switching. This is how the internet works. Of course, there's no guarantee that the person on this end is actually going to read it. The packet switching network planned by ARPA used phone lines, but in a way that had never been used before. When you make a phone call to your, to your mother-in-law and then talk to her on that phone line, whether you talk fast or slow or halt in the middle, uh, you tie up the phone line the whole time. Computers tend to talk in little bursts when they talk to each other. So there was a lot of technology that had never been done in trying to, to break up messages into packets and send them over the phone lines. Vint Cerf was at UCLA. Bob Kahn was at BBN. Two more pioneers who helped design the ARPANET. They're not exactly household names, but they should be, as we'll be hearing later. There is an electrical linkage, an electromagnetic linkage, between your telephone and the other one, which stays up, fully connected, until the conversation is over and one of you hangs up. It would be the equivalent of in order to drive from, let's say, Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, having to reserve the whole road, you know, for you to make the, the trip, and it's not a very efficient use of the road space. To build a network linking mainframe computers over telephone lines, in the 1960s there were two monster companies you'd expect to be involved. But both AT&T and IBM declined to bid. When I asked AT&T to participate in the ARPANET, they assured me that packet switching wouldn't work, so, um, so that didn't go very far. The telephony attitude, um, I hope my phone doesn't get cut off, the telephony attitude uh, is not very compatible with packet switching. What is the telephony attitude? Well, the telephony attitude is we're going to guarantee certain capacities. It's, it's, it's about guaranteed levels of service. It's about investments that, uh, that you make, that you get back over decades, um, and the world is simply moving much faster than that. The difference between a person talking on a phone line and a computer sending bursts of data is simple. Computers do it quickly and more efficiently. Sorry, Mom. Packets are just like postcards. You know, they've got two and from addresses, and they've got a finite amount of, of content on them. And like a postcard, you, know, you put it into the post box. If you put two in, you don't know what order they're going to come out. They might not even come out on the same day. Uh, some of them get lost. That's true of packets. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't necessarily follow the same paths to get to the destination. That's also true of, of electronic packets. The only difference is an electronic packet goes about 100 million times faster than a postcard. So while NASA was sending men into space, the team at BBN was shipping packets down phone lines. Basically, I knew nothing. 
I would also say that most of us on the team didn't know anything about packet switching because, in fact, we were inventing packet switching. There were a lot of very difficult, detailed technical problems. But I don't, breakthrough would not be how I would describe any of that. I, you know, I tend to think of breakthroughs as inventing DNA or uh, something else. And there was none of that, really. Yeah. I think, actually, God invented DNA. <laughs> And I think none of us had any doubt that we could do it in, in nine months. It was an engineering task. It was a fun one. Yes, we were going to have to work day and night and weekends, but not so hard. By an odd coincidence, the ARPA-funded scientists designed the blueprint, wrote the software, and built the computers for the world's first digital network, just as NASA's Apollo program reached its lunar climax. Two visions of science and technology, one begun in 1958 and the other in 1961, would both deliver the goods within a few weeks. Kind of neat, isn't it? I wonder what became of the space program. Come here, I want to show you something. It's right over here. This is a historic machine. It's the first IMP on the ARPANET. IMP stands for Interface Message Processor. Today, we would call it a router. Back then, it was a mini computer that was connected to one or several mainframes here at UCLA and made possible packet switching. The packets would come in, the IMP would sort them out, error correct them, and either send them to those local machines or later, when there were more IMPs, send them across the ARPANET. Oh, you can tell this thing was built for the military. It's built like a tank. And for the first 7,792 hours of the ARPANET, it made sure that we got a message instead of a mess. After just nine months' work, the moment of truth. The first imp was ready to be blitzed with bits. On budget, on time, this was a government project? My laboratory was the place where the internet came to life. It was then called the ARPANET. We, were the f we had the first switch, which was called an IMP, an interface message processor. It was wheeled into my laboratory over the Labor Day weekend in 1969. And on Tuesday of that next week, we had bits moving back and forth between that switch and my host computer. Len Kleinrock was so moved by his historic role that 30 years later he wrote a poem to recall the romance of imps, nodes, and technical specifications that only geeks could love or rhyme. It was back in 67 that the clan agreed to meet. The gangsters and the planners were a breed damned hard to beat. The goal we set was honest and the need was clear to all. Connect those big old mainframes and the minis lest they fall. BB&M delivered the product on time, 1st of September, actually a little earlier than the guys at UCLA hoped. Our software wasn't quite ready when the hardware showed up and we, it was Labor Day weekend and we were sort of hoping that it might be delayed and they air shifted. BBN had promised that the imp was running late. We welcomed any slippage in the deadly scheduled date. But one day after Labor Day, it was plopped down at our gate. Those dirty, rotten scoundrels sent the damn thing out air freight. Battleship gray cabinet with eye hooks in the top so that a helicopter could lift it. And it was a refrigerator-sized object with a computer in it, a Honeywell 516, and with special interfaces that had been designed by Ornstein uh, and built by Honeywell in that cabinet so that it would then connect to host computers at each site. And inside was a program which had been written at BBN. So, so <laughs> the machine shows up, they get it on a forklift, and it goes into the UCLA facility, and they turn it on, and it picks up where it left off. You see, the government sometimes picks dates for the hell of it. I mean, there was no reason. If, to be truth known, uh, it was an artificial date picked by the government and picked by Larry Roberts. I don't know how the devil they picked it. As I recall that Tuesday, it makes me want to cry. Everybody's brother came to blame the other guy. Folks were there from ARPA, BBN, and Honeywell, UCLA, and ATT, and all were scared as hell. We cautiously connected, and the bits began to flow. The pieces really functioned, just why I still don't know. Messages were moving pretty well by Wednesday morn. All the rest is history. Packet switching had been born. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Seven weeks before the ARPANET sparked to life, Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 
Time will tell whether Apollo or ARPANET meant more for mankind, but there's no argument who had the better sound bite. A month later, a second imp was ready at Stanford. What memorable message was sent? All we tried to do was log on from our host to their host. You know, that's the remember, we're engineers, okay? So I had one of my guys set this up, and we also had a voice line in parallel with the data line. So he had a pair, pair of headphones and a speaker, and so did the other guy at the other end. And so we typed in L, and we said, did you get the L? And he said, I got the L. So you want to type in L-O-G, and then the rest would be L-O-G-I, it would span out the word login. You got the L. Hit the L. Did you get the O? Got the L. Did you get the G? Crash. The <laughs> system failed on the G. And a couple of hours later, we successfully logged in, did some minimal things, and logged off. That was the first message on the Internet. Log in. Crash. <laughs> <laughs> The ARPANET was born at a tumultuous time on campus. You were more likely to meet hippies than hackers. Some hippies were hackers too, and thought computers could be used to change society. Stuart Brand was one. He founded the Whole Earth Catalog, Bible of the 70s Alternative Lifestyle. It had a great impact on the first generation to use the Internet. Hackers succeeded and hippies failed. <laughs> uh, same group of people, same length of hair. Um, only instead of drugs, it was computers. And I think the main difference there is that drugs never got any better and computers just kept getting better and better and better. And uh, the kind of money you could make with drugs was problematic and the kind of money you could make with computers was fabulous. Ted Nelson was another visionary who grasped the potential of computer networking in his book Computer Lib long before it was technically feasible. It's not that I claim to be smarter than other people, it's just that most Technical people don't understand the creative process, don't understand the problems of ideas, and of, of evolving ideas, and of the representation of ideas, and the, represent, the evolving representation of evolving ideas, and the intercomparison of the evolving representation of evolving ideas. And that's the issue. It, it, nothing less will do. Howard Rheingold, a Whole Earth Catalog writer and career high-tech hipster, believed computers could become tools of liberation. It's not so much anti-establishment as empowerment of the individual. The belief that if you can give people tools, they can do things. They can make the new, better society. And that uh, joining some crusade to create some great cause has, has failed. In 1972, I wrote an article for Rolling Stone called Fanatic Life and Symbolic Death Among the Computer Bombs. And the opening line was, ready or not, computers are coming to the people. And it was pretty much uh, you know, foretelling what came to pass, which was that uh, computers had been liberated from the IBM mainframe approach to life. The idea that computers could really be used for extending our intellects and communicating with each other was something that didn't emerge for a while. That's how it started, is, is you know, turning a mainframe into a personal computer. And then they just found various ways, first with time sharing and then with actually making these things to make personal computers. The idea was power to the people, straight out of the you know, straight 60s doctrine. Advances in computer networking weren't limited to the mainland. Scientific experiments in Hawaii couldn't be easily connected by phone lines. The solution was to use radio. So was it the engineering challenge that drew Norm Abramson to Hawaii? Actually, it was the surf. I was teaching out here, actually, at Stanford when I first saw Hawaii um, about... Uh, 30 years ago, and 29 years ago, I decided to move there. Uh, it took me about a year to find a university position there and move to Hawaii to go surfing. I don't know much about the University of Hawaii, but it doesn't just jump to mind as a hotbed of computer research. Uh, it isn't, but the surf is a hell of a lot better than it is here. <laughs> we convinced uh, Larry in particular that uh, 
we could do something that had never been done before technically. And this was what, the Aloha Net? It was the Aloha Net. It was the first network that decided uh, yeah. that it was sensible to transmit data into a computer by means of radio waves rather than uh, telephone lines or, or conventional wires. And we put a, a radio channel together, connected it in a, in a new way to a computer, a, a very primitive computer at that time, and demonstrated uh, wireless data for the first time in and out of a computer. And, and you were doing wireless data in Hawaii because of there are islands, is that it? Frankly, I was doing it because of the surf. By 1970, packet switching networks were running on phone lines, radio, and satellite over long distances on land and across the oceans. It was, theoretically, international. By 1972, the ARPANET had grown to include 20 locations, including MIT. The pioneers from BBN settled down to managing and extending the network. But still, hardly anyone knew about it. So Larry Roberts at the Pentagon decided it was time to let the world know that ARPA had invented the future of computing. I had Bob Kahn organize this huge show for us of the network where we had dozens of network terminals and we had an imp on site in the, the uh, hotel in Washington. And everybody brought in all their stuff and got their computers online. Basically set up a node on the ARPANET right on the ballroom, right on the floor of one of the ballrooms. And with a false floor, we wired it up and we actually got donations of some 40 or 50 computer terminals from different manufacturers and then we orchestrated uh, with a variety of uh, different uh, research places to put applications up on their system and, and make them work. In Washington he was logged on to a machine at MIT. There, call up a program from UCLA whose job was to execute and run and send the data to a printer right next to him in Washington. So you can imagine, you know, MIT, UCLA, Washington, you know, at those times, moving things around the country was, was really hard. What was the public reaction? I think it varied from the light that we had so many people in one place doing all the stuff and it all worked, to astonishment that it was even possible on the part of people who just did not know, weren't exposed to this before. It was a real, real event. It was a kind of a... Uh, a, a happening, you know, like happens once in, once in your lifetime. Throughout the 70s, the ARPANET grew. Other networks were created too. But there was a problem. Each network was different with its own rules. You couldn't send packets from one network to another, let alone through another to a third. There was no common language, no common way to communicate, no way to get a program from one to the other. So we basically had a serious problem in transporting anything uh, in, in terms of knowledge. So we had no way to essentially, like language, for civilization to grow. And we were stuck back like the, um, the man before he had language in terms of being able to exchange and build on the past. As far as usage of the network goes, uh, for a while it was very, very, very underused. I, I think it was a little bit like having a, you know, a, a very good highway system and no cars uh, uh, because there weren't very many programs set up to use it. The, the, the individual universities did not have protocols, uh, rules. In other words, when you, when you call somebody in France, you could have a perfect connection, but if they don't speak English and you don't speak French, you still don't talk much. So, so even though this network was put in, uh, the hosts couldn't talk to each other in many cases about very much. TCPIP. These are probably the five most important letters of the information revolution. They stand for Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol. What a mouthful. In the Glossary of Geek, a protocol is the rules that control how different computers talk to each other. The TCPIP protocol was invented by Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn. It determines how computer networks talk to each other. Without TCPIP, there would be no internet. What an achievement, and yet such a name. They could have named it WOW or KISS, but TCPIP? 
Bob and Vint decided to work together to crack the problem. On one of his visits to the Bay Area, Bob stopped in to see me at Stanford and was describing for me these other packet switching networks that he was developing and pointed out that he knew that he needed to find a way of interconnecting them. If BBNN had one network and let's say AT&T had another, it would have been possible just plug the two together with a box in the middle and BBNN and AT&T wouldn't have had to do anything to make that work other than agree to let their networks be plugged in. And so we began to think about uh, the question of protocols that would allow such an amalgam of networks to enter work. We did that work in the early 70s and that was before the Ethernet was on the scene. It was before the personal computer and workstation. So, I mean, what we did anticipated all that and by virtue of the niceness of the architecture, the modularity of the architecture, it allowed for any network to fit in there and any computers, including the local area nets of today. Their seminal paper was published in May 1974. They called it a protocol for packet network intercommunication. It's a real page turner. Every new information technology needs something that makes people just have to buy it. It's called the killer application or killer app. For the IBM PC, it was a spreadsheet. For the Macintosh, it was desktop publishing. And the Internet is no exception. This is a communication network. So guess what? The killer app is a way of communicating. Email. And that's how the lowly at sign jumped from the keyboard into a place of honor in computer history. Electronic mail was also invented at BBN back in 1972. A program for sending files was adapted to carry a mail message between two mini-computers. Ray Tomlinson is modest about his invention. It was just a hack. And um, the, the next step was to get other people to try using it because so far I'd only sent mail to myself first and then to the other people in my group. Ray's hack has driven networking for a generation. One of the first applications we put on the system was from Ray Tomlinson's network email. As soon as email came on, it took over the network. But it was hard to believe that that was going to be a major use of the network. It really was. That was not what had been touted in the first place, that sending messages back and forth from uh, people from person to person was going to be a uh, large use of the network. Uh, it was hard to believe for a long time. People to people communications was what excited people. You know, machine to machine or human to machine was not all that exciting. And where did that icon of the internet, the little at sign, come from? Credit Ray for that one, too. I looked at my keyboard on the Model 33 teletype. The one that was most obvious was the at sign because this, this person was at this other computer. In some sense, he was at it. Um, he was in the same room with it anyway. And, um, so it seemed fairly obvious, and I just chose it. But with email, you know, you could communicate with a lot of people very, very quickly. Sometimes in the middle of the night, it made it possible to start to move things around that uh, you wouldn't have thought about, uh, dealing with people in different time zones. and So it, it really caught on quite a, quite a bit. So you're the guy who invented the use of the at sign in, in email addresses. So yes. I'm Bob at Cringely.com. Mm -hmm. So I can thank you. Well, thanks a lot. A lot of people have said that, <laughs> especially, the one, especially with the advent of junk mail. And, and of course, you, you, you now have infinite wealth. No. No? <laughs> no. And how does it feel to have changed the world? Oh, it feels wonderful. I think, I think it's uh, incredibly exciting. I think that uh, uh, it's, it's the kind of thing where now you go down the street to your neighbors who never knew what a computer was in the days you were doing this, and they're all of a sudden experts at using the web and uh, think that's a lot of fun. So no, it's, it's, it's quite nice. Technologically speaking, the 60s hit two home runs, Man on the Moon and the first computer network. But the funny thing is that none of those pioneers got rich, though at least the astronauts made it on primetime television. As for the geeks who invented the ARPANET, who laid the foundations for the information age, zilch. Neither fame nor fortune. It took the invention of the PC before someone hit the jackpot, and what a jackpot it was. But that's for the next part of our story.
Remember Excite? By March 1997, after three years, they'd gone from packing code in a garage to become an internet media company. Revenues from advertising were into the millions, and they'd outgrown office number three. Time for another move. Three years ago, we visited with six kids in a garage working on their dream. Starting with $18,000 and a bag of brown rice, they built Excite into a company with 200 workers worth a quarter of a billion dollars. And this is just the start. It has to be. Because in the world of internet business, the rule is, grow or die. You see, we moved from the garage to the dining room. Uh -huh. We moved from the dining room to an office about 5,000 square feet. We moved from that office to this office about 12,000 square feet. And now we're moving to our final resting place. I wouldn't have even guessed that we would have moved into the Garcia office that, that, we, that we were at. The, you know, 2,000 square foot office with little dingy cubes. So that was a step up for us. And then to move in here and then to move into our very own building, it's just a surprise. Excite is visible proof of the Internet's astonishing progress. Its growth mirrors the expansion of the wired world. In four years, the number of Americans using the Internet has risen from 5 million to 62 million. Traffic on the Internet is doubling every 100 days. And the fun's only just begun. We're only two years into this huge revolution called the commercial use of the Internet. We're only two years in. Think where other industries were just two years into their lives. Think where cars were two years into automobiles. Oh, they were terrible. I mean, bicycle wheels, a tiller for the steering wheel, a motor that took you at five miles an hour and died in about a half a mile. If you look back in history, past the scope of this program, past 1970, past 1900, back to when we were human beings in small tribes hunting and gathering, Everybody you had to deal with was somebody you saw every day. And we're a species that's based on communication with our entire tribe. And one thing that modern communication does is make it possible, again, for us to communicate with anybody in the world. Unlike the PC, it lovers the top line. It helps us entertain and inform and educate and inspire and sell and make community, uh, even make meaning out of life and out of death. And, and, and that's a far more powerful dynamic than uh, cranking out memos and doing financial analyses with a spreadsheet. Think of this as uh, just a few milliseconds after the Big Bang. I mean, we only barely discern the fundamental laws of physics, the business models that are going to work. What better place for a Big Bang than CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Research? Believe it or not, this is where the explosive growth of the Internet began. Here in Geneva, Switzerland, the next great Internet breakthrough, the World Wide Web, was created by an English programmer named Tim Berners-Lee. There was always different sorts of people from different countries who brought different sorts of computing equipment. And so CERN was at the forefront of making gateways for file transfer exchange so that you could get files from different sorts of computer, email exchange so that you could get email from the proprietary systems to cross borders and go into uh, another proprietary system. And oh, I wasn't involved with that. That was the spirit. There was a lot of networking. Despite all this networking, there was no simple way for CERN scientists to retrieve information from each other's computers. In fact, it was exactly like the Internet on a small scale. <laughs> I'll be at this forever. What I'm trying to draw here is 160,000 computers in 800 different networks, all running different operating systems, different programming languages. It's a mess. And that was the situation faced by Tim Berners-Lee. He wanted to find a way to get information from this computer over here to this user over here. And the question was, how to get it. 
in fact, it was basically technically trivial to go and get it. It just happened that you had to be a guru of the highest degree to actually be able to navigate all the networks and figure out all the programs that you would come across on your way and, uh, and know, the, uh, you know uh, what commands to give them to actually get the data back. And the chances are when you got it back, you wouldn't be able to actually uh, read it anyway because of all the incompatibilities. I started in October writing a, a program called, which I call World Wide Web. When you're reading something, you could, if it's interesting and you've got right access to it, you could just highlight a phrase, hit a hotkey, control, shift, N, and it would bring up a, another window. Tim Berners-Lee's greatest achievement may have been giving an address to every bit of information on the internet. You've seen these things. www.cringely.com That's my web page, and this is the address called a Universal Resource Locator. Forget about that. The important thing is that you don't have to know about names of files, you don't have to know where this is, you just have to remember cringely.com, and you're there. By inventing HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Tim figured out how to embed an address under any word or picture you like. And then when you click on that word or icon, you automatically jump through the internet to, say, the Cringely domain. Ah, there's a website for sore eyes. The power of a hypertext link is that it can link to absolutely anything. That's the fundamental concept. The fundamental idea was anything which was out there somewhere sitting on a computer disk where that computer was attached to a network you ought to be able to give it an address you ought to be able to make a link to it the uh, key insight that I think I credit Tim Berners-Lee with is the URL the idea that there's a uniform resource locator that says I can point at any particular bit of information on the internet if I mean that you should go to this, this university look in their FTP archive look in their file archives and download this picture of a Corvette and put it up on the screen I now have a way of doing that so that's why the characters HTTP backslash www have become as familiar as Coca-Cola. In fact, Tim's idea wasn't new. Twenty years earlier, computer visionary Ted Nelson, author of the seminal hacker work Computer Lib, had proposed a global network. He called it Xanadu, a magic place of literary memory, after Coleridge's poem Kubla Khan. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sacred sea. Xanadu was measureless too. It involved storing all the world's literature on databases and accessing it through links which Ted called hypertext, with an automatic system for paying royalties to authors whose work was used. But like Coleridge's vision, Nelson Xanadu never saw the light of day. But Tim's invention did, and the World Wide Web turned a network for geeks into something everyone could use, though not everyone's pleased. Tim Berners-Lee uh, figured out that the key was extreme simplicity. And that's um, very painful to me because, of course, now the Websters are trying to grapple with all the issues we were trying to solve in a single design at the beginning. And the World Wide Web... Uh, it's pretty awful. I mean, I, I, I dearly love Tim Berners-Lee, and I think he's a great guy and a wonderful idealist, and has he just achieves wonderful things. But the uh, the unfortunate thing about the World Wide Web is just how how messed up it is. Perhaps it's sour grapes, but at least Ted Nelson can claim the creation of hypertext. But does he? Hypertext is obvious. <laughs> so I do not claim to have invented hypertext. I merely discovered it. It's, it's like the telephone. Now, the telephone at the time seemed to be an invention. To, to us now, it was a discovery. Because it's obvious. Okay. So hypertext is like that. To me, it was simply the obvious next step of literature. What is hypertext? Hypertext is non-sequential giving. Excuse me, too, Ted. I must get back to the World Wide Web. Tim's solution for the world's particle physicists turned out to be a solution for everyone, helping to network incompatible computers. CERN wasn't in the Internet business, but in 1991, they published the code, and within four years, the World Wide Web was sending more packets than any other Internet service. They took the bit, bits and pieces that existed and figured out a way to put them together uh, and make it work. Uh, it was a tour de force. The people who did the World Wide Web were really willing to take uh, existing pieces of things, 
in god-awful condition in some cases and figure out a way to make it work and the worldwide web people deserve a lot of credit for what they did I mean what they did was very difficult the web is success precisely because it is not a monolithic new software product you don't get web 9.0 in the mail on CD-ROM the web is a collection of a whole bunch of small technologies that fit together because a, you know, a couple dozen people all thought about how they'd work together cool and they're all being evolved constantly in real time by thousands of people around the world and there isn't any central release you can't go anywhere to go buy a copy of the web the fact that the world wide web did work I find it's not just exciting for itself but exciting for the whole idea that you can have an idea you know some idea and it can take off and it can happen uh, it means that sort of dream is all over the world you <laughs> take heart and not stop the web was a huge step toward wiring the world, but more changes were to come. One of these happened far from CERN and far from Silicon Valley, too. It happened here. U.S. government money made possible the ARPANET and the Internet. But there was a catch. There was no commerce allowed on the net. When this restriction was finally lifted, it wasn't Bill Gates or any of the other digital titans who turned the Internet into a commercial marketplace. No, it was the folks on the hill, the custodians of capitalism. It was Uncle Sam. Roll the drums and sound the trumpets for the congressman from Virginia's Fightin' Ninth District, the Honorable Rick Boucher, who in 1992 amended a law. Here are the historic words which made all the difference. This future ubiquitous network for voice, video, and data communications of all kinds will connect homes, schools, and workplaces. It will constitute an essential ingredient for our future economic competitiveness and will open new worlds of information and services for all of the nation's citizens. This is Congress speak for you may now buy and sell things on the net. What made it easy to do so was one more software breakthrough. Time for another word from the cringely glossary of geek. This word is browser. It doesn't sound like much, kind of a laid-back word, but there's nothing relaxed about the browser because it changed the face of the Internet. Here's how the Internet looked in the 1980s. Lists of text. This is Stanford University, but you'd hardly know it from looking. It's not very user-friendly. It's actually hard to find what you want, and frankly, it was mainly a tool for nerds. And then came this, an attractive, easy-to-use shop window, a gateway to the riches of the Internet. This is a browser. And just as the Mac made a PC into a computer my mother could love, the browser opened up the Internet to everyone. It was not at Stanford, but on a Midwestern campus that the second great innovation of 90s Internet technology took place. Here, a bright kid named Mark Andreessen was earning minimum wage at nights, writing code in a supercomputer center at the University of Illinois. His prototype browser was a piece of software called Mosaic. We ended up sort of in the middle of the night starting this project that we called Mosaic. What we were trying to do was just put sort of a human face on the Internet. The Internet at that point was a tool for researchers and scientists. For years, Bill Joy had been telling me that someday we'd back a 21-year-old kid who would write software that would change the world. And lo and behold, sitting in my office is this 23-year-old, not a kid. I mean, he's a very mature, hulking, <laughs> uh, young executive. And uh, Mark said the software is going to change everything. For me, this whole thing started exploding with the invention of the browser, you know, Mosaic, because suddenly the Internet was accessible to the average person through this rich graphical interface. You didn't have to know these arcane protocols. You didn't have to be a nerd anymore to access the Internet. Mosaic put a face to the web. And Mosaic plus the web then finally gave us a way to express to the non-technical person what all of us in computing knew was the tremendous value of having networks interconnected. And now everyone's a webhead and everyone's excited about the web. Those ideas have been present for 20 years, but it took a killer application, clearly Mosaic. Mark's Mosaic browser spread across the internet like wildfire. It brought him to the attention of an ex-Stanford professor who had already made millions from one startup and felt like doing another, Jim Clark. I said, look, if you can, if you can, um recruit all the guys, every single guy who helps you write that program, then I'll put my own money in it and we'll just start a company and figure out some way to make a business out of it. And that's, that's exactly what we did. I put three million dollars in. We flew out to University of Illinois four days later, signed them all up. 
After a brief tussle with Illinois over the Mosaic name, Jim and Mark's new company became Netscape. Their product was a Mosaic killer, Navigator. Jim's plan for the company was, well, minimalist. Well, my attitude was, if 20, 25 million people are on the net today, one million of them are using Mosaic. This was, bear in mind, April of 94. Um, and we can displace Mosaic. There's 24 more million people who would like a product like this, presumably. And the market, the, the size of the net was doubling roughly every year and a half. So I mean, by the time we had our products in the marketplace, it would be 50 million people. So you've got to be able to make money with 50 million people using your product. And that was, that was the sum total of the business plan at that time. It, it didn't take a rocket science to figure out that there was a big market here. And uh, we had uh, one meeting with Jim and Mark after that, decided to invest, and then set about on a crash program of 120 days to hire four vice presidents and a world-class CEO and get the Netscape product shipped. Well, for fortunately, time. fortunately, you had the money. Uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity. The money was easy. It was knowing the opportunity and recruiting the people. Well, in about a year and a half's time, we had 65 million users. The most rapidly uh, assimilated product in history. In other words, no one had ever achieved in the small base of 65 million anything. In fact, I don't know if anyone had ever achieved, achieved that kind of install base in anything except perhaps Microsoft. So, and Beanie Babies. And Beanie Babies, okay. In 1994 and 95, Netscape was known as the fastest growing company in the industry with all the requisite Valley attributes. Shiny, low-rise buildings, Generation X workforce, and a parking lot reserved just for roller hockey. Today, they're famous for the fact that they're going head-to-head -head with Microsoft. The folks in Illinois did some clever work early on. Now, that happened to include Andreessen and you know Netscape got formed, but there was some clever work done at Illinois. There's always going to be some clever work done someplace that's not here. Hopefully, there's a lot of clever work done here too. But there's always going to be some clever work done someplace else. And number two, we had a big thing we had to get done called Windows 95. And while we managed to get a browser done and built in because we weren't asleep, it didn't get the same kind of passionate forward, 100 percent focus that we love to give things because. We had a lot of that focus already into doing the basic job of Windows 95. And so a little bit of cleverness and a little bit of sort of other priority was all it took to create a window. That's how dynamic and competitive this industry is in which Netscape emerged. We also were making money on it. <laughs> you know, that was it. We, our first full year of business was $75 million in revenue, and the next year was $375 million. We were, until Microsoft kind of came in and, punched us in the face, we were the fastest growing company in history. It's another example of With his Navigator browser dominating the internet, these were sunny days for Mark and Netscape. The storm would come later. Thanks to the World Wide Web and the browser, the internet was transformed. Suddenly, here was the recipe for commercial opportunities in cyberspace. A giant feast of digital delights laid out for anyone with a PC and a modem to enjoy. So how does it work? The internet is like a giant restaurant. You look in a menu for something that appeals, order it, the order goes off somewhere and is served up by a waiter or waitress. Well, the internet's the same way. The individual PC that's ordering the information is called a client. And the big computer at the end of the line that provides what the client needs is called the server. These days it often takes so long, perhaps it should be called a waiter. The business of building these servers is another of the opportunities created by the internet. And serving up information turns out to be very profitable. It's selling like hotcakes. The biggest of these information providers is America Online, a company now worth $16 billion. Even in the real world of trains, planes, and automobiles, many of us still need a tour operator to package our travel. Founder Steve Case saw a similar opportunity in the virtual world, offering beginners the internet experience in an all-in-one package. Now this may be a virtual world, but it still needs real hardware. In all this talk of wiring the world, it's easy to forget that someone actually has to do the job of wiring it. And that's happening here at America Online's new data center in Virginia, where computers and routers and modems are going in that are going to give 10 million people access to the Internet and beyond.
Excuse me. Welcome. You've got mail. In 1982, bought my first computer and wanted to hook it up and be part of this this, this online world and, and went to great lengths to make that happen. It took many months, hundreds of dollars to get the modem to work with the software, to work with the cable, to work with the computer, to actually connect to this this this, this uh, world. So it was very frustrating. At the same time, I found it kind of exhilarating that I actually got it to work and I was able to access information and talk to people all around the world from my little desktop in Wichita, Kansas, which is where I was living at the time. So I thought the whole thing was really quite magical. And the companies that are leaders in making that happen and popularizing that concept for a mainstream audience, I think are going to be very, very successful. And we'd like AOL to be in this new interactive world what AT&T was in the telephone business 100 years ago, or Microsoft has been more recently in the, in the software business. There's a, there's a big opportunity here. Oddly enough, Microsoft wanted to be the Microsoft of the online market, too. But for a change, Microsoft didn't succeed. The Microsoft Network was our uh, decision to get into the online service business. Uh, we thought that for people at home in particular, this would be explosive. And we, we very much uh, believe that to this day. Uh, Electronic mail, staying in touch with your friends, seeing what's going on in the local community, getting up to date news, uh, and having that be nicely packaged with chat sessions and neat new software features. We saw a market for that. Even I made a foray into this marketplace. Back in 1994, Apple Computer created an online consumer service called eWorld. One of its notable attractions was the columnist Robert X. Cringely. At the time, I made this bold statement. So my job on eWorld is to create controversy and therefore get a lot of people talking over the electronic back fence. Impressive. eWorld went belly up, though Apple fights on. And me? Why do you think I'm schmoozing with the guy who runs America Online? He has 10 million subscribers already. But 80% of Americans aren't wired. That's what I'd call an opportunity. There are more users, more websites, and more data sources joining the Internet every day. Plenty brings its problems. The more places you have to look for information, the harder it is to find what you want. We need help. So people have invented tools for the job. Search engine, another word invented for the Internet. The World Wide Web is an enormous collection of database libraries that hold information rather than books. The problem is, how do you find what you want to know in that mass of information? Well, librarians cracked that problem years ago. They invented the catalog. Rather than look individually through all those books, I can find what I want by searching this card catalog. On the Internet, the same thing is accomplished by a search engine. It continually catalogs and indexes every word in all those databases. So if you want to know about, say, the career of Arnold Schwarzenegger, go to the search engine. It searches its index, and presto, there's everything you ever wanted to know about Arnie. And a lot you didn't. Two things are constant in Silicon Valley, the steady consumption of soda and change. Excite's original product was just a search engine. Now they've built a business around it. They changed the company name. The offices changed from grungy to glitzy. And in 1995, they became that web phenomenon, an internet media site. A cross between an electronic newspaper and a cable network, funded by advertising. We call ourselves publishing on steroids. So devoid of print, paper, and ink, we do what a publisher does, or a cable provider does. We aggregate consumers around our programming, and then we sell that demographic back to advertisers. The different ways to make money in the Internet are just beginning to emerge. For Excite, the model is a media channel with content to attract me and advertising to catch my eye while I'm there. But there are other ways. 
pay-per-view, mail order shopping of every kind, games, auctions, and services with no earthly parallel. They're all putting their faith in a new medium to deliver the big payoff. Every time a new visual medium is invented, one application drives the market. This was true for still photography, true for motion pictures, it was especially true for VCRs, and it's true for the World Wide Web. I'm talking about sex. Sex sells, but there is a market for it, and it's true capitalism. If there's a market for it, it will be filled, and it's legal, and there's nothing wrong with it. In the beginning of this industry, like other industries, people are willing to pay for adult content. The home video cassette industry is, is a prime example. Initially, people were paying several thousand dollars back in the 70s for machines uh, to go home and basically watch adult content. As part of this job, of course, you have to type. Is there, is there a typing speed requirement? No. You know, you want to have your nails manicured and everything, and nails do slip a lot on the keyboard. Sure. But as long as you just like simple things like, hi, how are you, babe? You know, and you could just put R, U. You don't have to put the whole word down. Sure. And then most, most of the time you're saying, oh, yeah, baby. So you go, oh, oh. <laughs> then you go, oh, baby. <laughs> does your mom know the, the, the work you do? Yeah, actually she does. Yeah, she's okay with it. You know, it's the 60s thing. She's all in that 60s life. Oh, you had a hippie mom. Yeah. So it's it's great now. Cool. Well, no, would not understand. But then anything with computers? Mm -hmm. Oh, honey, you're moving up in the world. Exactly. And computers, that computer thing, that's going far, that's going far. That's features in computers. So as long as they tell them about computers, it's fine. It didn't take long for the advertising industry to notice the growing number of eyeballs staring at websites, or for website operators to start selling those eyeballs to the advertisers. In 1999, online advertising revenue will reach $2 billion, and it's been doubling each year. How about advertising? Well, people say, what a puny number. The software industry only had $300 million in advertising for that internet supported internet companies that were supported by advertising. Well, I say, like, yo, a year before that we had zero. Now we had 300. This March we had 57 million. Who thought we would own advertising? Advertising is the most uh, frequent form of money making for us and we have enough people coming to our various online sites that advertisers are interested. And so that's been, uh, for the last two years, uh, the majority of our revenue. But then uh, merchandise as well. We have books, we have primers, email services. We do free massages as well. Meet two wise fools, Tom and Dave Gardner. They are dedicated to debunking the gurus of Wall Street and sharing financial advice with other net users. The Motley Fools, an archetypal web service, irreverent, inclusive, and informed, and growing like crazy. In the internet, things change every three months. You just can't possibly prepare. If, if a typical company grows about 10% a year, we're growing about 15% a month. That means each month feels like a year. And if you saw Dave, he's about a foot and a half taller about a year ago. I was a, I was a fetching fellow back then. The Molly Fool today is a media company which is, whose mission is to teach people how to invest their own money. We have 600,000 households coming to the Motley Fool every month. Building communities where people can aggregate ideas. Let's say we, ha we put 100,000 people together in a block that are going to buy insurance or they're going to buy mutual funds. If we can package them together have everyone work together, we're going to be able to cut prices significantly. And that's the beauty of, of, of going online, of being online. You have a voice. Everyone has their little uh, publishing house right there in their home. Everybody has ideas to share. What makes a good fool? A fool is someone who thinks for herself, somebody who uh, is willing to roll up his sleeves and make his own decisions. One size fits all, actually. Yeah. It's just a, oh, <laughs> there, my reputation precedes me. <laughs> Nothing foolish about saving money on groceries. A website called Planet U sends your grocery coupons direct to the checkout, replacing bulk mail and saving trees all at once. The idea came from hyper nerd Christine Comerford. The key concept is eating. If you don't eat, you're dead. 
Okay? So how about taking the most basic thing that we all have to do, right, and bringing those packaged goods, the people who promote this salsa, whatever, wheat thins, okay, bringing those people to advertise on the net, because you've got to buy paper towels anyway. So the thing is, 325 billion coupons are distributed in the USA annually. 2% are redeemed. Only 2%? 2%, 2%, yes! 98%, all right, end up in the rubbish or in the recycling. It is okay. totally ineffective. So once you grab your Planet U promotions, either from a partner website or from the Planet U website, you can then say, I want my promotions mailed to me or I want my promotions delivered to the store that I shop at. Aha. Uh -huh. So you can deliver them to the point of sale system. You walk in, you identify yourself by swiping whatever card you set up as your ID. All right, and then kaching, the register receipt has a deduction. Kaching is right. In 1995, there were 27,000 commercial websites. In 1998, three quarters of a million, 30 times as many. Mail order is becoming email order, and you don't have to dress up to go shopping. In fact, you don't have to dress at all. In terms of infrastructure costs, buying underwear and your underwear is hard to beat. And if you buy the same underwear, you know exactly what the product is. You don't have to look at it. You, you buy once in wear 34s or whatever, you know, kangaroo pouch, you know, you know, 12 pair. Please mail it to my house. There's this very American temptation to use the internet to sell things. But what to sell? Well, everyone on the net can already read and write. So the first big commercial success is using digital technology to push that most analog of products, the printed word. But this is not Gutenberg being replaced by the World Wide Web. It's Gutenberg enhanced, using modern technology to sell books. Lots and lots of books. In the spring of 1994, I came across the statistic that web usage was growing at 2,300% a year. And outside of a Petri dish, I hadn't seen anything grow that fast. I made a list of 20 different products that you might be able to sell online and picked books as the first best product, primarily because there are so many books. There's no way to have a 2.5 million title physical bookstore. The largest physical bookstores in the world only have about 175,000 titles. And there's no way to have a print catalog. If you were to print the Amazon.com catalog, it would be the size of more than 40 New York City phone books. The basic technology is fairly simple. The problem was the ubiquity of that technology. And this looked like, because of that growth rate, the first time ever that the basic technology needed to do electronic commerce in an acceptable way would be ubiquitous. So it actually turns out that the ubiquity of the Internet is more important than the technology of the Internet. The internet is creating the biggest Californian job boom since the gold rush. And America is running out of homegrown engineers. But the language of the internet is English. So wherever you come from, if you're a decent programmer and speak English, apply here. The sound of leather on willow. It's a cricket game. We're not in England. We're in Santa Clara County, the most heavily wired and networked community in the world. The Valley employs thousands of Indian-born engineers who bring with them not only their programming skills and their engineering degrees, but also their cricket balls and bats. Sunshine and a field to play is all we ask for. And since there's this big boom um, in America, in, in Silicon Valley here, um, which require a whole bunch of engineers to come all the way from India, you know, we make the big you know, uh, trip up to America to work, and then come here and find out that there's cricket being played. India is the second largest uh, country with the number of engineers after the United States uh, in the whole world. So I think that is a factor. And the second thing is because uh, it's an English-based system, it's a lot easier for people to come from India and integrate and uh, do business in the United States. With the arrival of the Internet, companies here can now fill their job vacancies with skilled Indian engineers who don't have to leave India. Could be bad news for the local cricket scene. I work in an industry where there's zero unemployment. You can't get skilled labor at any price. So we're scouring the world, world market to get programmers. The quality of the people is astonishing. The loyalty of the people and the work ethic, the quality of their English. I mean, everything just blew us away. 
we just had a fabulous, have a fabulous experience uh, uh, in, in Bangalore, and we're expanding our operations there very, very rapidly. Thank <laughs> you.